trying to be where much easier if you had a wee red button beside you at home just to take us in on it. But that's us live now. Okay, I missed the first part of that message, Clerk. Um, and I, and I, know, I know we are live. So. We're live now, yes. Okay, thank you, members. So we're going then to uh, our uh, agenda item, Abortion Services, Safe Access Zones Bill, the formal clause-by-clause -clause consideration. Uh, members, moving to that clause-by-clause -clause consideration of the bill, I will proceed through the clauses and put the questions formally. Uh, if there's not a, a consensus question, ask members to vote through a show of hands and the clerk will confirm the result of each vote. I advise members that where there are amendments to a clause, I will put the question on the amendment first. Where no amendments have been proposed to clauses and no issues have been highlighted, I will seek the agreement of the committee to group those particular clauses when putting the question. The question on any amendment that introduces a new clause to the bill will be put at the relevant point. So members, clause one is the overview. Um, the bill sponsor has proposed an amendment to this clause to leave out requires the Department of Health to establish and insert establishes. The amendment is as a consequence of changes to clause five. So I would propose that we consider clause one after we consider amendments to clause five if of the bill. So are members content with that? Yeah, thank you. So I move then to clause two. And I refer members to the text of the amendment at page 169 of the table pack, which is Bill Sponsor's Amendment A. So is the committee content with the amendment to clause one as proposed by the bill sponsor? Sorry, Chair, just to say, um, if you go on your brief, just the page five for clause two. That, sorry, apologies, that amendment was for clause one. Okay. It was, okay. So it page five for clause two. Yes. Thank, thank you, Clark. So, so moving then, yes, to clause two, which is premises where abortion treatments are carried out. The committee has a proposed amendment to clause two to replace abortion treatment with abortion services. The amendment is at page 172 of the table pack, amendment B. So, um, Pam, you are indicating there. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And um, just wanted to put on record that we appreciate the opportunity to put our concerns um, as a party within the committee report. Uh, I wanted to also state that intimidation and harassment in any circumstance is wrong, and we've been at pains to make that point throughout this scrutiny process. And it's really important that we do put that on the record. Um, we do, however, as a party, believe that there's much more work to be done to make this bill workable, and uh, we're concerned that the bill in its current form will be legally challenged if it makes its way to the end of the legislative process in this mandate without change. So we have major concern that the, as the bill stands, there is a conflict between an offence of influence and the right to protest, and we would be keen to see current harassment laws strengthened if need be to ensure concerns on the ground are addressed. So we understand all the decisions uh, will come to the chamber in time, and we understand that there are uh, there's also a potential for other amendments coming forward. So uh, just in terms of this process, Chair, if uh, pushed to a vote, we as a party will not be taking part in that voting process on the clauses of the bill, which is which is looking at taking committee position because we prefer not to take a position um, on the clauses of this bill at this point. Thank you. Deborah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's just to reiterate the points that Pam has made. Um, obviously, during the committee stages, I have made um, my concerns known to the committee in terms of this bill. Um, and I also want to put on record that nobody um, should face abuse or harassment in, in any um, public setting. And uh, we understand the hurt that they, that is caused to some people in relation to that. Um, but on on this particular aspect, we, we won't be taking part in the clause by clause voting. And uh, we have made our comments very clear, which will be um, submitted and, and put within the committee's report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it has been, I think, also clear throughout the committee process that the committee agree that this is a significant issue, that there are significant concerns around the harassment and intimidation of women and girls seeking to access services in our health and social care settings. Um, and that we have heard significant evidence to that effect 
from those on the ground and also in terms of the extent of it from the PSNI and the impact from various uh, various organisations and indeed the bill sponsor. So, okay, thank you. So members, I'm going then to uh, clause two again, which is to replace abortion treatment with abortion services. The amendment is page 172 of the table pact, amendment B. Is the committee content with the committee's amendment to clause two? I agree. Committee content, thank you. So um, I will therefore put the question uh, in relation to the clause itself. Is the committee content with clause two as amended? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Okay, the committee has agreed with, uh, and is content with clause two as amended. Okay, so moving on then members to clause three. Premises where information, advice or counselling about abortion treatments are provided. There are no proposed amendments members to this. So I will simply go straight to the question, is the committee content with clause three as drafted? Agreed. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the committee is content with clause three as drafted, clerk for the record, thank you. Uh, moving to clause four, protected persons. There are no proposed amendments to this clause members. So I will put the question, is the committee content with clause four as drafted? Agreed. Great. Thank you, members. Um, moving on to clause five, safe access zone. So I would remind members that the bill sponsor has indicated her intention to oppose the question that clause five stand part of the bill and to propose a new clause 5A. If the committee supports the bill sponsor's amendment, it will be required to oppose clause five. So I will put the question now, is the committee content with clause five as drafted? No. No. Uh, okay. If, so the committee is not content with clause five as drafted. So I'm therefore going to put the question: Is the committee content to table its opposition to clause five, standing part of the bill? Yeah, agree. Agreed. Yeah, the committee has agreed. So then we move on to new clause five a. The bill sponsor has proposed a new amendment five a. The text of the amendment is at tab twelve point two. Page 169, Amendment C in your table pack. So I will now put the question in relation to that amendment, that new uh, amendment. Is the committee content with the bill sponsor's proposed amendment to insert a new clause A? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Committee is content, uh, clerk, for the record, and uh, have indicated agreement. So then I will put the question that the committee recommends to the assembly that the proposed new clause 5A be added to the bill. Are we agreed? Great. 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 Members. So members, we will now go back to clause one as discussed earlier. Um, now we have a uh, dealt with clause five and 5A, five I will revert to clause one. So clause one here, the bill sponsor has proposed an amendment to this clause to leave out requires the Department of Health to establish and inserts establishes. This amendment is as a consequence of changes to clause five. Uh, so if members, um, is the committee content with the amendment to clause one as proposed by the bill sponsor? Agree. Great. Agree. Thank you members. I will then put the question that the committee is content with clause one as amended. Agree, Chair. Agree. Agree. Thank you members. Okay, thank you. So we will move on then members to uh, clause six. So clause six members is in relation to offences in respect of a safe access zone. The bill sponsor has proposed an amendment to clause six to leave out subsection four, which is, it is a defence for D to show that D did not know and had no reasonable way of knowing that the protected person was in a safe access zone. So is the committee content with the amendment to clause six as proposed by the bill sponsor? I agree. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, members. So therefore, I will put the question that the committee is content with clause six as amended. Agreed. Agreed. Thank Agreed. you, members. Uh, so the committee have indicated their, their agreement with clause six as amended. Thank you, members. Moving on to clause seven, enforcement of a safe access zone by a constable. There are no proposed amendments to this clause, members. So I will put the question, is the committee content with clause seven as drafted? Agreed. 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 Thank you, members. The members are content with Clause 7 as drafted. Clause 8. 
procedure for designating a safe access zone. So this 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 is a the one where the bill sponsor intends to give notice that she would oppose clause eight, the question that clause eight stand part of the bill and to propose a new clause eight a. If the committee supports the bill sponsor's amendment, it will be required to oppose clause eight. So is the committee content with clause eight as drafted? No. 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 And um, so the position of the committee, the committee is a. The committee is not content with clause eight as drafted. So therefore, I will put the question: Is the committee content to table its opposition to clause eight, standing part of the bill? Agreed. 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 The committee are content to table its opposition to clause eight, standing part of the bill. New clause eight a. The bill sponsor has proposed an amendment to insert a new clause eight a as follows. After clause eight, insert publication of safe access zones. Um, the department must publish a list of all protected premises and the safe access zones established under section 5A in such a manner as it appears to it to be appropriate. So is the committee content with the amendment to insert a new clause 8A? Agreed. 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 Thank you, members. I then put the question that the committee recommends to the assembly that the proposed new clause 8A be added to the bill. Agreed. 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 Thank you, members. The committee do recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause 8A be added to the bill. Clause 9, members, exercise of functions. There are no proposed amendments. Um, if the committee has agreed to the bill sponsor proposed new clause 5A, then clause 9 is not required. The bill sponsor has indicated her intention to oppose the question that clause 9 stand part of the bill. So, therefore, is the committee content with clause 9 as drafted? No. 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 Uh, so the committee are not content with clause nine as drafted. Um, therefore, I'll put the question: Do members wish to formally register opposition to clause nine with the bill office? Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Great. Thank you, members. So the, the members do wish to formally register, op uh, register opposition to clause nine with the bill office. Clause ten: Monitoring of effectiveness of safe access zones. There are no proposed amendments, so I will put the question: Is the committee content with clause ten as drafted? Great. Great. Thank you, members. Um, okay, clause 11, interpretation. There are two proposed amendments from the bill sponsor to clause 11 in relation to the interpretation. The first is amendment H at page 170 and removes the interpretation of convention, which is no longer required as clause 9 has been removed. The second amendment is amendment I at page 170 and provides an interpretation of recording. So I would put the question, is the committee content with the amendments to clause 11 as proposed by the bill sponsor? Agreed. Great, Great. committee is content. Um, so the committee is content with clause 11 as amended. No, clause Chair, 12. Chair, sorry, can we go back with that? If we're accepting the amendments from the bill sponsor, then it's just the bill sponsor's amendments we're content with, is that right? Um, some of our own amendments as well. We have some amendments of our own. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, just in, in Clause 11, they're, um, the bill sponsor's amendments, so um, the committee agreed it was content with the bill sponsor's amendments, and if you just put the question that the committee's yeah. content with Clause 11 as amended. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that the committee is content with Clause 11 as amended? Agreed. Yeah, and therefore, uh, yeah, yeah. So the committee has agreed that it is content with clause eleven as amended. Thank you. So clause twelve then is commencement, and there are no proposed amendments to this clause. So I will put the question: Is the committee content with clause twelve as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you, members. The committee is content with clause twelve as drafted. Clause 13 is the short title. There are no proposed amendments. So I will put the question, is the committee content with clause 13 as drafted? Agree. Great. Great. Thank you, members. The members are content with clause 13 as drafted. Moving on to the long title, I will put the question, is the committee content with the long title as drafted? Agreed. 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 Thank you, members. That the committee is content with the long title as drafted. So, members, that concludes clause by clause scrutiny of the abortion services safe access zones bill. We will now consider the committee's draft report on the bill. 
Um, a copy of the draft report is included at tw tab 12.1 of your table packed. So, Clerk, I'll just check with you. In light of that, we have made some, uh, agreed some slight amendments to the report. Is it the case that, that the report will be circulated to members and members will agree by email uh, by, by lunchtime tomorrow? Is that? Yes, sure. That's in relation to the main body of the report. What we, we can do at the minute is agree the, the formal title pages and appendices. Yeah. Um, and we can get them agreed at, at today's meeting. Okay, so we move through then the, uh, the the those elements of the of the uh, of the report members that that have been agreed and then approve the amendments then can be approved in addition. So first of all, I will refer members to the title page of the report, table of contents, committee powers and membership, and a list of abbreviations and acronyms at pages one two nine to one three three of the pack. Are members content with this section as drafted? Yeah, members are content. Thank you. Members are content with this section as drafted. I also refer members to the appendices at page 167 of the table pack. Are members content with the section as drafted? Yeah, members content. Thank you. Are members content that the minutes from the meeting are approved by the chair so that they can be included as part? The minutes from this meeting are approved by the chair so that they can be included as part of the report. Great. Thank you, members. Are members content for committee staff to make any necessary formatting changes in advance of electronic publication? Agreed. Yeah, members are agreed. Thank you. Are members content to agree the executive summary, introduction, committee consideration, and clause by clause sections of the report by correspondence? Members will need to indicate approval before lunchtime tomorrow. Are members content? Yeah. Thank you. In terms of publishing of the report, then, members, are the members content? That the Committee for Health is content for the report on the adoption. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Have I the wrong title in there, Clark, in the, in the brief? Yes, yeah, sorry. That, that, that's, a, that's a mistype. It should be the safe access zones. Okay, so just give me a second to make sure I get this correct for the record. So, members, in terms of publishing the report, that the Committee for Health is content for the report on the abortion services safe access zones bill be published tomorrow afternoon following approval. Agreed. Yeah, members are content. And members, can I also seek your agreement to issue a link to the report to the organisations who provided evidence to the committee and to the department? Are members content? We provide that link. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you, members. Okay, members, moving back then to agenda item one, which is apologies, and uh, I think we're full of tens, so no apologies, clerk, are you correct? Correct. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything there today in terms of chairperson's business, so moving on to draft minutes. I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of 25th of January at tab 7.16 of the table pack. Are members content with the minutes? Content. Thank you, members. And there are no matters arising from those minutes. So, members, we're now moving on to uh, the Adoption and Children Bill. And this morning, we are moving to agreement on the draft report. Excuse me. I remind members that the draft report on the bill was discussed at the meeting on Tuesday and members asked for a few changes to be made. The revised draft is at tab 1.3 of the table pack. Copies of the bill and the explanatory financial memorandum are at tabs 5.1 and 5.2 of the pack. So, Clerk, could I just ask you to speak to the revised report and remind members that the report must be agreed today uh, because the end of committee stage is the 28th of January. So um, we have discussed this in quite some detail, but there were some revisements to be made. So, Clerk, if you could just speak us th talk us through those, please. Thank you. You're on mute. Thank you. Um, just the outline, um, following discussion on Tuesday and the formal clause by clause, there are some amendments to the report. We put in now the executive summary, which highlights some of the key areas that the committee suggested recommendations in. We've also highlighted that some of those agreements are pending um, further information being received from the Human Rights Commission in relation to definition of harm and in relation to the new clauses around disclosure of information, um, pending um, confirmation that there's no issues with data protection and public records legislation. Um, so they've been highlighted also in relation to there was discussion around Schedule 2 um, which was the requirement to attend interview with counsellor. 
Um, so you'll see if you go to page 12, um, paragraphs 22 and 23 just outline um, that it is a complex issue. He recognises the importance of counselling and support and believes the Register General, General should provide people with all the relevant information in relation to support and counselling. The committee also outlined that if counselling is not wanted before disclosure, counselling should, support should be provided when required and that support and counselling should be provided in a timely manner. Um, so those were the, the, the main issues that were highlighted on discussion on Tuesday. Um, so they're reflected um, both in the executive summary and also within the, the main body of the report. Chair. <clears throat> yes, Carol, go ahead. Sorry, it's just for clarity or clarification. Is it not is it not already the case that the Registrar General advises uh, anyone seeking their birth certs or anything that they should get? It's already there. Is, is that my understanding? It, it, it is already there. It's a duty on the Registrar. I think the, the point that some members were making is that the Registrar should also advise if they don't wish, wish to take a counselling that it is available further down the line or, or when needed. Um, so it's just not a case of saying you can have counselling now, but it's maybe further advice to say if it's needed after you see the disclosure, then it is available. Thank you, Chair. Okay, any other questions or queries in relation to that, members? Or members, uh, anything further, Keith, then, in relation to the, the report? No, Chair, just the outline. It obviously takes into account the committee's clause by clause from um, so a big bulk of the report, I think it's about 30 pages, maybe it's just the clause by clause. Um, but no, it's, it's, um, that's, that's the key issues. Okay, thank you. So, members, we will now then formally consider the draft of the committee report on the Adoption and Children Bill and agreement will be sought on each of the sections of the report, uh, similar to previously there. So do members, any members wish to declare an interest? Um, I think I will just declare my own interest as having previously worked as a social worker um, and, and being on a continued leave of absence with the, with one of the health trusts. Any other yeah. interest members wish to yeah. declare? Carol, yeah. Sure. I want to declare an interest as a former keeper of the records of both DECAL and DFC when it comes to access to public records. Thank you, Carol. Anyone else? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, members. So I'll move, I'll move on then. Uh, so, members, any further comments to make on the draft report? Just a final check. No, thank you. If not, then I'll move on, members. So I refer members to the title page, table of contents, committee powers and membership, and list of abbreviations and acronyms, which is at top pages four to eight of the table pack. Are members content with this section as drafted? Yeah, members content. Thank you. I refer members to the executive summary at pages 9 to 13 of the table pack. Are members content with this section as drafted? Thank you. I refer members to the introduction and committee approach at paragraphs 1 to 15 at pages 14 to 18 of the table pack. Are members content with this, this section as drafted? Members are content. Thank you. I refer members to the consideration of evidence received at paragraphs 16 to 97 at pages 19 to 38 of your table pack. Are members content with this section as drafted? Yep, members are content, thank you. I refer members to the clause by clause consideration of the bill, which is at paragraphs 98 to 100, at page 39 to 74 of the table pack. Are members content with this section as drafted? Members are content, thank you. I refer members to the appendices at pages 75 to 77 of the table pack. Are members content with this section as drafted? Yeah, members are content, thank you. Are members content that the minutes from this meeting are approved by the Chair, that's this meeting that we're having today, are approved by the Chair so they can be included as part of this report? Yeah, members are content, thank you. Are members agreed, are, are members content for committee staff to make any necessary formatting changes in advance of electronic publication? Yeah, members are agreed, thank you. So I will then put the question in relation to this, that the Committee for Health is content for the report on the Adoption and Children Bill to be published. Thank you. And I will also like to seek the Committee's agreement to issue a link to the report 
to the organisations who provided evidence to the committee and to the department. Are members content? Yeah, members are content. Okay, members, so at that juncture, before we move on to our next our next item, I want to sincerely thank um, all of the organisations. Those are two significant um, bills that have come through the committee this morning. And I want to thank all of the organisations and people who give evidence to committee in writing, um, by way of oral evidence, and assisted the committee in any way in that regard. I also want to thank the committee staff for the uh, extensive work that they had to do to both bills, both very significant and both very heavy pieces of work. So I want to thank the clerk of the committee and each and every one of his staff for the input they, they gave. I also want to thank the bill clerks in relation to this. Um, I think there was, again, very extensive work. We had to trawl our way through fairly significant and important amendments and, and the impacts of those. I think we diligently uh, trawled our way through those with very, very useful and invaluable support from the bill clerks. So I want to thank Catherine and Denise in relation to that. Um, so the other the other uh, thing that I wanted to just was to thank members for their diligence and work. There has been a massive amount, and I don't think maybe uh, massive, one, in, in one in, in one two week period, the committee met six times in order to consider fully the evidence from, from, from some of these bills. And particularly, I want to thank all of those in relation to the adoption bill, all of those parents, all of the foster cures, and very much in particular, all of the children who took time out of their evenings to come to the committee, give us their perspective, give us their expertise, allowed us to make what I think are really invaluable amendments in, along, along some of the ways and add critically add value to, to what is a very important and a long-awaited bill. So I want to send a, our very warm thanks out to each and every one of those. So thank you for that, members, and, and uh, I think that's a very, uh, a very useful piece of work and, and demonstrates once again that this has been and is a committee that is very determined and has worked very hard in, in relation to the area of health and delivering change for all of our people on the ground, positive change, much needed change, and much and very welcome change. So Gora Mila Mila Mayagov Martian. Okay, members, so we are a little ahead of time at this stage, and I just want to... Uh, yeah, so what I, what I propose, members, is we maybe move to correspondence and forward work programme because the officials on the, uh, we're just working to get the officials on the line as we're a little ahead of time. So I'll go straight then to correspondence, if members are agreed. Yeah, thank you. So, members, there's a couple of items I want to draw members' attention to there. First of all is correspondence. Item 12.3 is correspondence from the department regarding the outcome of the judicial review in relation to respite care in the Southeastern Trust during the pandemic. And I just want to say, members, and I want to take members' views on this, but I think this is a further endorsement of the urgent need to restore daycare and respite services, and also a reflection on the, the absolutely desperate impact this is having and continues to have on families. I met again with, with, with one of the trusts yesterday and also with families who are struggling to, to try to get those services restored. I, they, many of them members are at breaking point. There's no, there's no getting around that. And I think we should be writing again to the department, asking them, are they addressing the issues around distancing? Um, because that's a, major, that's a major factor in terms of not being able to establish the full services. So are they addressing the issue around distancing? And if the distancing, uh, if, if that remains an issue, then what other steps are they taking to mitigate that or to extend, add further, further space? Because I, I, I honestly think this is something that I do not understand why these families had to wait so long, and I am genuinely concerned and fearful for the impact it's having on them longer term, and I think there would be a heavy price to be paid for that individually in health services and and in, in a across, right across our society. So I think we need to write in the strongest possible terms and ask the department to urgently address this issue with the trusts. It cannot wait any longer. There has been a court judgment that I think is relevant, and I think that needs to act as a wake-up call to the department to act immediately. So I have indication from Pam, then Paula, then Colin. Thanks, Chair. Yes, uh, I couldn't agree with you more on this particular topic. Um, I, I think it's appalling that, that, that families have been left without 
those services for the length of time um, that it's been and they're absolutely at breaking point and it's not acceptable and I think it, we need to bear in mind where we are in terms of the pandemic as well. Uh, we know we're in, a, we're in a better place because Omicron has been milder and I think urgent change needs to happen to ensure that that, that support um, those supports are put back in place and it's as soon as physically possible because it is unacceptable that these people have been left um, to cope with little to no help um, throughout this pandemic um, and we're all understanding of how this came about in the first place and, and the fear of the unknown and all the rest of it but I think there's no excuse now at this, this point not having those services restored so I would support your call to uh, and back that call to, to write the department um, and, and make our views very clear. Yeah, and, and actually I think we should CC that each, into each of the trusts as well, just so, so there's no time lost, and then make it very clear that this cannot, this simply cannot wait. Uh, Paula and then Colin. Thank you, Chair. It's a bit of a side issue to that, but I, I note today that England have um, reduced their restrictions in terms of care home visitation, and Scotland did likewise last week, and uh, while it's not around these daycare centres, I think that it's another way in which I think we're falling behind in terms of supporting families and individuals who are in these settings. So I would appreciate if we could also write to the Health Minister to find out when he's going to be reviewing the um, guidance and restrictions on care home visitation. Thank you. Yeah, and if members are agreed, I would suggest we do that as a separate letter so that the two issues are, are treated separately. If, if members members content with an approach to that. Yeah. Colin, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, and I think it's a very important issue that's raised. I think we've all been approached at various stages by individuals that have been affected. And as this is, um, you know, relevant to the southeastern area, but I think it is across all of the trusts, as you've mentioned. But would there be a way of us maybe asking the department what measures were taken to ensure consistency? Because it was very difficult when you were hearing trusts doing different things in different ways. And also how sometimes the restrictions that were being introduced were differing from those that were being sent out centrally. So maybe if we could ask the department what efforts they made to ensure that there was consistency during the process, because that became very frustrating for us as we were hearing that different places were doing different things in different ways. Um, and it made it very, very difficult to try and update constituents as to what was happening. So if we could get that flavour of the department where they actually applying consistency. Yeah, members content that we that we also in, include that to see how that's how that's being addressed. Yeah, I think members are content. Um, so okay, members are content there. Um, yeah, I don't think actually. I think that's the only one that I had. I thought there was another one there, but I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure if. Uh, I don't recall it there at the minute, so I can come back to it if, if necessary. Are there any other items of correspondence that members wish to? draw um, attention to? No, okay. Okay, well listen members, thank you that, uh, so, uh, Clerk, there's an item here, update before the end of the mandate, can you just clarify what that, that item is in relation to? That was just in relation to 12.3, if members wanted an update on what was happening before. Uh, with, with the southeastern trust before the end of the mandate, but um, yeah. I think the letter covers it. Yeah, that's that's fine. So, um, members, any no other comments? Are members then therefore content with the actions as outlined on the correspondence memo? Yeah, members are content. And moving on to the forward work program, I refer members to the forward work program at tab eight point one of the table of papers. Um, clerk, I'll ask the clerk just to outline the forward work program for us there, please. Thanks, Chair. Just the, um, th this is us up until the end of the mandate. Um, we've, we've provisionally scheduled all the issues that members would want the briefings on. So it included briefings on the cancer strategy from um, the trust chief executives on pressures um, and compass. Um, there's a whole raft of issues that the committee had agreed it wanted briefings on. So we've tried to, to schedule them in over the, before the end of the mandate. Um, just to flag up some in particular, Thursday the 3rd of March, we're hoping to have a bit of a stakeholder event. Um, whether we can do that in person or whether it's virtual, we're, we're still considering, but that'll be for all the organisations that have said they want to meet with us. And, and we'll sort of do maybe 20, 30 minute sessions with each of them, um, just to get through them and, and hear from them before 
the end of the mandate. So hopefully that'll be on Thursday the 3rd and I'll give a bit more information whether that'll be in, in person or, or online further down um, near it. Um, the other thing to say is we've had some discussions um, with the Disabled Persons Parliament about possibly doing a bit of a, a meeting with them um, where possibly we would make them part of the committee for the day and um, bring, well, it's um, officials of the minister to come and we, we do a briefing as we normally would and hold a committee meeting, but they'd sort of be part of the, the committee for the morning. So we're, we're still sort of scoping that out and looking at it. Um, we'll maybe have a look with the, the youth assembly as well to see if there's something we can do with them before the end of the mandate. Um, just to flag up, I, I've been advised there's a number of LCMs coming in the next um, number of weeks. The department, I think, advised me of up to half a dozen on a various different issues. Um, so they'll all need to be be scheduled in. And then, of course, we have various stat rules as they come along as restrictions ease. Or, so they'll need to be be scheduled in as well. So. Um, th this again is just their best guess for the rest of the month and um, pulling in everything that the committee had said that they wanted to be briefed on and so we'll start trying to tie some of these dates down but um, again just to flag up um, while it's great we've got all the bills done it it's still going to be quite busy from here on in just hearing from all the different groups and organisations that we wanted to. And uh, Keith, where is the item in relation to that we've discussed on, on several occasions around joint meeting with the committee in the south in relation to pandemic? Yes, yes sure. It's down there um, to be scheduled. I, I'm in discussions um, to see if what date suits best um, and looking at a possible um, meeting in person. So I am. So that's why we haven't flagged it in the, a week yet, um, just because we thought we could be a wee bit more flexible if it is um, maybe an in-person meeting. Okay, thank you. So I have Hans indication there from Pam, then Paula. Pam, go ahead. Maybe that was from previously, Pam, was it? No, sorry. No, just trying to get off it there. No, thanks, Chair. No, just to say that, uh, that I'm happy enough with the forward work programme, although I would like to see the transformation issue be brought forward to as, as soon as we possibly can. I know it's in there for pretty much the last meeting before uh, we finish. Uh, so I think that would be really important. It's such an important topic um, and it's been so long delayed. I, I'm not sure we should be leaving it to the last meeting if it was at all possible to jiggle that about and to make it happen sooner that would be good. But I, and I do welcome the uh, we have the Encompass programme in there as I think that's really important um, in light of transformation and uh, in light of you know the changes that need to be made. And we need to see, you know, what the progress is on that and what the potential um, uh, is for that use um, throughout. It, it also might be worth it, too, if, if we could have a, um, a briefing with um, Community Pharmacy NI as well. Um, in terms of transformation, maybe that could be included as, as part of that meeting. Uh, but I can speak to the clerk after about that. That's OK. OK, so... Clark, you, you take a, a look at that. I think committee's content broadly with that. I have a hand up from Paula then as well. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I maybe imagined it, but did we not, did I not at one point ask for a, an update on the department's work on um, commissioning abortion services? Is that not something that I'd asked for? Sorry, Chair. Um, we, again, that, that's in for Thursday, the 10th of March. So it is... Um, Again, we haven't firmed any of these up. We were just putting them on there, so we can move things around um, with discussions with um, with departmental okay. officials. But um, it, it's it's on the the four work program there for the, okay. the tenth of March. But we, we will that that could well move just depending on um, other briefings okay. as well. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, thank you, Chair. It's just, is there any possibility of getting an update on the neurology um, situation? I appreciate there's ongoing legal cases, but but I don't know what impact, if any, they'll have on the public inquiry um, coming back with their report. I just think it would be good, even 
to try and get a synopsis of where things are at and when the report will be published. Will it be done before the end of this mandate, Chair? Yeah, okay. Uh, Claire, can you can you consider that and see how that might be um, factored in? Yeah. Okay, members, um, thank you for that um, discussion. So, are members then content to note the forward work program uh, along with, with the comments that have been made here today? Yeah, members are content, thank you. Okay, members, we're going to take a short a short comfort break then just to, to we get everything lined up for the next session. Um, Clark, maybe can you indicate there is five to 11 or would you prefer if we go for 11 just to make sure we have officials online? Five to eleven is fine. We, we've got the official or um, those given evidence lined up, so um, okay. five to eleven is fine. Okay, so we'll return again at five to eleven members, and we we'll resume then. Thank you very much. See you shortly. And Clark, can you just take us out of the session? Okay, Chair, that's us off now.
Can see and hear me okay? Yes, sure, hearing you fine. So that's us. Sorry, your camera's not on? Oh, that's it now. Yes, so that's, that's us right. live now. So we're going to item seven, hospital char parking charges bill. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Member, officials are on the line. So thank you, members. We're resuming then, members, at, at uh, item seven on our agenda today, hospital parking charges bill. Evidence from the Royal College of Nurses, AH, the Allied Health Professionals, um, Marie Curie and Nick Ectu. So this is the second of our evidence sessions on this bill. I refer members to copies of the bill and explanatory financial memorandum at tab 7.1 and 7.2 of the pack and to the written submissions received from these organisations at tab 7.3 and 7.6. Also included at tab 7.7 7 is a written submission from the Rural Community Network. Um, apologies have been sent for today's evidence session. We also have a written submission from Macmillan Cancer Support and that's included at tab 3.8 of the table pack. The patient and client council advises that it has been unable to make a written submission due to time and resource pressures. So I would now like to welcome to our committee today, first of all, uh, Dolores McCormick, who is Associate Director for Employment, Relations and Member Services with the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, good morning, Dolores. Are you able to hear us okay? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you, Dolores. We are also joined by Leandra Orr, and Leandra is the from the Allied Health Professionals Federation. Good morning, Leandra, and are you able to hear us okay? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I'm able to hear you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Tanya Killen from Nikiktu. Um Tanya, are you able to hear us okay? I am indeed, Colin. Thank you. Okay, Tanya, we are seeing you there. Your volume's a bit low, so just maybe when, when we come to you there, maybe if you can see if that can be adjusted up slightly. But we are hearing you okay. And finally, last but by no means least, Joan McEwen, who is Head of Policy and Public Affairs with Marie Curie NI. Joan, can you hear us okay? I can indeed. Thank you, Chair. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, I, I want to welcome each and every one of you to the committee to thank you for taking your time for coming today. I think I think all of your organisations certainly have been to the committee previously, but um, I, 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 I look forward to uh, providing your evidence this morning to fault your over leg. And if I could ask you to do a short, brief presentation each, um, as, as brief as you can manage, we'll then go to members' questions. If, if one person can answer the substantive question, uh, that's fine. If if members need to provide some additional information, then that's fine. But I suppose we want to avoid a repetition of just just so we can move through as many questions as possible. So if members can approach it, if Alan can approach it in that sense, and if I can ask members to keep their questions as succinct as possible, so we can move through as many questions as we as we can. So I'll go back just in the order that we we brought everyone in, in the order that's on my list here. So I'll go then. Yourself, Dolores, uh, if you want to go ahead with your brief opening remarks, please. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair, and good morning to the committee. So, firstly, um, thank you for this invitation this morning to the Royal College of Nursing to address the committee today. My opening remarks will be very brief, as members have already received our written submission in relation to the bill. So, let me begin by stating, you know, quite clearly that the RCN supports this draft legislation. Our members are opposed to the imposition of parking charges for nursing staff within the HSC. For many nurses, and particularly for lower paid nursing staff, parking charges can be a significant expense. Our members also believe that parking charges impact negatively on nursing workforce recruitment and retention at a time when we can least afford any such impact. Our written submission explains in their own words the consequences of parking charges for nursing staff and on this basis the RCN rejects the view that free parking could only be provided by cutting patient services. Without nursing staff there are no patient services. That has become very clear in recent months. It is not the fault of nurses that trusts are unable or unwilling to provide adequate parking capacity or that Northern Ireland has such an inadequate public transport connectivity. However it is nurses and other healthcare workers who are asked to pay the price of these failings. If this pandemic has taught us anything, surely it is the need for the department and the, and the trust to start viewing nursing as an asset to be cherished and nurtured 
rather than as a cost to be contained and controlled. One way by which this approach could be realised is having the common sense, and I'd have to say the good grace, to abolish these unreasonable and unnecessary charges. I hope these brief remarks have been helpful and I look forward to responding to any questions uh, members may have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dolores. And I then go across to Leandra. Um, Leandra, could we get uh, your opening remarks, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair, members of the Health Committee, Leandra Archer, National Office of Society of Radiographers. And I'm actually representing AHPFNI today. I'd like to firstly thank the Health Committee for inviting us to provide evidence on this topic. I'd like to start by saying that no allied health professional or indeed any other member of health service staff should be paying to park at their place of work. We represent 13 professions and all are fully in support of the introduction of the abolishment of car parking fees. Now more than ever, we need our AHPs, our radiographers, our paramedics, our physiotherapists, our occupational therapists, to name a few. They've been dealing with the COVID pandemic, as Dolores has said, but um, for nearly two years now, along with increase in vacancy levels and workforce issues. Many of them are working excessive hours to ensure sustainability and effective service delivery. Health service staff have gone above and beyond, and this additional tax has to be removed without delay. The Health Committee listened to the evidence last week, and there was a number of issues were discussed at length. And what we would ask is it's important to remember that Scotland and Wales abolished these fees in 2008 and 2009. They would have encountered the same problems and it's encouraging that they have found a way forward. And I'm sure we can with innovative, proactive thinking and planning, we can too. In relation to many AHPs, and we have talked about this in our submission, that they do use equipment which they cannot bring with them on public transport. Many of them have to use the car parks within the hospitals and they are incurring you know fees for multiple journeys in and out and back back and forth to their bases. Many pay public tariff rates which range from about one pound to eleven pounds in some sites. Many of the AHPs and other health service staff are struggling with increasing costs and rising inflation. And we have AHPs that are parking on side streets which are dimly lit or a long walk from the hospital sites because they can't afford the parking fees. And there have been a number of reports of AHP stating that they felt extremely unsafe walking to and from their cars alone. Every employer has a duty of care and they're expected to provide that for their employees. And in this case, we feel they're failing. Many of our AHPs work in 24-hour, seven-day services and they live far from their place of work. The use of public transport is not viable as the services do not cover their working hours or their insufficient routes to their areas where they live. AHPs have been instrumental in transforming services during the COVID pandemic and they've implemented new ways of working such as tele appointments, virtual outpatient appointments, which have greatly reduced the number of face-to-face -face attendances that have been required by patients. The Department of Health has stated that they want to reduce health inequalities in Northern Ireland and AHPs are greatly invested in this. It's interesting to note in a recent study by the Government's Office for Science, it showed that 66% of the elderly population could not reach a hospital within 30 minutes using public transport. And this was the case for most rural and urban areas in the UK. Therefore, transport by car is their only alternative. And there's a requirement, obviously, to use the parking facilities. The question that we must all ask ourselves is, are we are patients making decisions not to attend hospital appointments due to the parking costs? And indeed, with rising fuel costs, our health service may be inaccessible for those that live in poverty. Can I just finish by saying that Andrew Bevan stated, illness is neither an indulgence for which people have to pay, nor an offence for which they should be penalised, but a misfortune, the cost of which should be shared by the community. The ethos of the NHS is free at the point of use and we are failing when we are charging patients and their carers for parking at the very first point of access. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Leandra. And I will go then to Tanya Killam. Tanya, go ahead, please. Uh, um, um, Glad to see you have feedback there. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm not a feedback, Tanya. What I might do is go to, I might go to Joan and see can, can maybe, the, maybe or just before I go to Joan, maybe the clerk can advise, is there something that, that uh, we can 
is there, is there something you can see, Clark, that Tanya can do or should do differently? No, Tanya. I'd maybe suggest if you if you left and come back in, um, okay. that that might help. But um, I think Chair, you're right. If we're going to Joan, then we can bring Tanya back in after that. But yeah, okay. if you left the call and come back in, we'll get you back up, Tanya. Okay. And if you have a second, Tanya, if you have a second device, you may need to switch that off. So I'll go then across to Joan. If you could go ahead with your remarks, please, Joan. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for the opportunity to present Mary Curie's position on this bill and its impact on people with a terminal illness in Northern Ireland. Mary Curie supports the bill. Uh, we believe it will help to relieve some of the financial pressures facing terminally ill people, their carers and their families and loved ones. Uh, people with a terminal illness uh, face a number of significant extra costs and are also much more likely to visit the hospital on a frequent basis. And car parking charges are just one contributor to the financial strain that they are under. The reduction or the abolishment of these parking charges would leave dying people and their loved ones with more money to afford essentials and meet their daily living costs. And that in turn would help uh, with their quality of life in the time that they have left. Um, we know that uh, people with a terminal illness are more likely to have additional support needs that incur additional costs, especially if they want to be cared for at home. And we know that that's where <clears throat> most people want to be cared for, and we know that that helps to avoid unnecessary hospital admissions and, and incur um, the costs on the, on the health service. That can include things like expensive equipment for home adaptations, um, wheelchair ramps and stair lifts, and um, also additional costs for things like specialist food, higher phone and broadband, broadband and energy uh, bill costs. And on the energy costs, uh, we know that um, that element can impose particularly high costs, and particularly in Northern Ireland, it's compounded uh, by the recent rise in energy bills. Um, and that's brought about by the unique disadvantage imposed on Northern Ireland customers because we only have two uh, gas suppliers here. And also we know from National Energy Action that um, during the winter in 2021, their staff were dealing with a growing number of requests for, from, for help from people with terminal illness in Northern Ireland. And we heard just yesterday that there was uh, an expected further hike um, announced by the utility regulator as well. In addition to that, um, these households are doubly disadvantaged, as well as the higher outgoings that they have to um, pay for. Uh, they are compounded by a decrease in income. Terminally ill patients often are forced to give up their work as their condition deteriorates, and that's further exacerbated because their carers also have to often reduce or stop working altogether to look after them. Uh, we know that um, over a fifth of informal carers um, of palliative and end-of-life care patients reported having to reduce their working hours to provide care, and 43% of them said they were struggling to make ends meet financially. We know as well that while the specific data around car parking is limited, we know as well that it is a significant issue um, by uh, people with terminal illness. Um, a survey of households um, impacted by motor neuron disease across the UK found that hospital car parking charges were among the top 10 most expensive regular costs they faced, and a report um, for Northern Ireland by Macmillan suggested that parking for outpatient appointments was costing people with cancer in Northern Ireland £37 a month on average, and that's about £450 a year. I'd like to highlight that these charges aren't optional for people with a terminal illness or their families, um, they are inescapable. Um, similarly, opportunities to visit a dying person in hospital can't be passed up by their loved ones due to the limited amount of time they may have to live. And driving is, is often the quickest and most convenient way for them to do um, to visit their loved ones. Um, and as well, to add to that, the symptom and, symptom and health trajectory of someone with a terminal illness is very often unpredictable, so these costs can't be predicted or budgeted for. We know as well um, from our own research, Marie Curie, that um, the, obviously the deaths are expected to rise and particularly around the face of death, we know that deaths will be going up to about 18,500 um, per annum between 2020 and 2040. And the hospital setting will remain the biggest, um, the, still the largest percentage of where deaths will occur 
so that figure and pressure is only going to continue. This bill offers an opportunity for us to end the postcode lottery that we very often talk about here, um, particularly for people with a terminal illness. But we'd like to highlight that, that this inequity exists on a number of different levels. Um, first of all, we know that it's already been highlighted by, by others on the call today that the parking charges are not equ equitable across Northern Ireland and they, they vary very, very widely. So there's quite a disparity. In, in the actual charges. We know that the charge exemptions uh, systems that are in place in some sites, whilst they are very welcomed, they don't cover um, everyone. And we know that, um, for example, in, in the Royal Victoria, the exemption system doesn't include people with chronic respiratory diseases or advanced neurological conditions. And we would like to see that considered very carefully. So abolishment of that would, would address that. As well, currently there are um, waivers in place and that is at the discretion of staff. So that obviously um, varies widely across Northern Ireland and also to highlight that the eligibility for the hospital travel cost scheme doesn't include those in receipt of personal independence payments, which is an anomaly for us. Um, we welcome the bill and we would we would also add that this would help to end the postcode lottery for terminally ill people, their carers and their loved ones in Northern Ireland so that they don't have to face the extra cost going to a hospital at such a stressful time. Okay, thank you. Um, is that is that sorry just to check there's a wee delay there? Is that you, Joan? Is that you finished your remarks? Yeah. Thank yes, you very thank much. You. And I think we do Thank you. I think we do have Tanya back on the line, so I'll just go back and check your line. Tanya, go ahead, please. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me a bit better now, Colin. Much you better. Can. Thank you, Tanya. That's great. That's great. Um, Tanya Killen, NIPSTA, um, Joint Branch Secretary of the Belfast Trust, and here on behalf of Nick Ectu. And firstly, I'd like to thank the committee for um, allowing us to um, give a brief pre presentation I'll begin just by affirming just how important uh, car parking issue is for workers across trusts on both a practical, financial and a symbolic uh, level. From the shop floor to the top floor of our movement, there is nothing to divide activists within unions from the position that car parking should be free for staff and our determination to address the car parking issues which affects our, our membership. Um, colleagues on the call have already um address some of the issues that I would also I'll not repeat them but the importance of these issues are evidenced by the level of activity on car parking related matters within and across each of the trade unions from local branches to the region. We would assert that car parking charges are an additional tax and a financial burden on workers many of whom who are underpaid for their work in the health service. To our members, car parking charges is an extremely emotive uh, subject. Staff have worked tirelessly to care for the sickest and the most vulnerable in society and are justifiably angry at the injustice of having to pay to attend their place of work. Charging uh, dedicated health uh, service workers um, to pay for parking at work is shameful at the best of times, but it really is an utter disgrace during the middle of a pandemic. It is our view that it's nothing short of exploitation taken from the wages of hard-pressed staff who have endured, endured real terms pay cuts for years. At a time when the entire health and social care is crippled by chronic workforce shortages, it is important that we create conditions that will make the sector more attractive for workers. There are significant uh, inconsistencies, as colleagues have, have uh, detailed, in car parking charges across the trusts, but also within trusts, which in themselves then create inequalities and pay parity for workers. The variability across um, trusts is a real source of frustration for uh, staff and our members. And it's evidence from staff exit interviews, which have shown that a reason that staff are leaving the services is, be is because of car parking charges. In a climate where retention of staff is critical, it's an affront to charge staff to attend their place of work, many of whom who actually require their cars to discharge their duties. It's imperative that measures are taken to retain staff within the trusts. Value in staff should be a priority and it has to be recognised that car parking charges are causing real financial hardship for, our, for workers. 
We owe a huge debt of gratitude to our workforce for their her heroic efforts pre and during the pandemic. And a simple way of showing this is to abolish car parking charges. We strongly are off the view that car parking charges are both morally wrong and unfair. During the pandemic, the work workers were showered with kind words and gestures, but these were all empty when faced with hefty car parking charges. It's not acceptable that the health workers are bearing the brunt and subsidising the health system, which has been under-resourced and underfunded for years. Sadly, the decision to revoke car, free car parking charges and backtrack on the pledge for free parking during the pandemic only confirms to NHS workers that the government puts money before their well-being. The abolition of car parking charges would be a practical indication to staff that they are valued and supported and a real term show of recognition for the critical uh, work that they undertake. And we hope that you will take the comments that we have made um, into consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Tanya, and thank you to, to each of you. That is a, that is um, quite stark, I think, in some ways. Some of some of the some of the issues we've heard, and I suppose in general, this has been an issue that the committee has has also raised previously. I raised it with the uh, with the minister in relation to even extending the mitigation, the, the, the removal of charges, and I have to say, I, I was disappointed that wasn't done at a time when we are asking health and social care staff right across the board to work above and beyond their capacity as a result of workforce vacancies, increased pressure from the pandemic. As you said there the, at the end, Tanya, pre and during the pandemic, these pressures were existing. To be taking staff back in from their leave on weekends and for the first thing for them to do is to meet a barrier at which they have to pay to, to go into park to cover that shift which they're being asked to cover, um, I think is, is totally contradictory, I have to say. I recall the time when everyone was out on doorsteps clapping. I recall even in the assembly people saying we must do more than clap. And I personally think this would be one such measure which would clearly demonstrate real, real value. But also, and I think this is even more significant, deals with what is being clearly identified as inequity and inequality and significant barriers to people even being able to remain within the service. We're acutely aware as a committee of the retention, never mind the recruitment pressures that there now are. So I think that's that's something that is that is hugely important. On the rural area, the rural issue that and, and there were figures mentioned there of, of uh, the, the extent of the impact on rural areas. I I can fully agree with that. Where I'm sitting today doing this meeting, if I don't get an Ulster bus two miles away from here in the Brantley, if I don't get on an Ulster bus at a quarter past eight in the morning. I have no further access to public transport. And if I don't be back on that bus for a quarter past five in the afternoon, I'm not going home either. And that's the extent of the public service transport in the Brantley area and many other rural areas besides. So it's simply not practical. And that in itself is an inequity. Um, also, the scale of the charges that we've heard there are shocking. I think it's 450 or 480 pounds referenced in some cases. We, we have heard information in relation to the Belfast Trust area in particular, people paying up to 60 pounds per week. So those are all issues of concern and, and I think issues that, that, that we could and should address on behalf of, to me, the, the arguments against this have all come down to essentially how do we control the parking and how do we pay for it? And that, that, those are questions. It's a question of, that is the question, how do you control it? And, and certainly that's something that, that you need to do, but also who should pay for it. And I don't believe that it should be the workers who pay for it, or indeed sick patients, or families who are under significant pressure already. So um, in, in light of that, and in light of the, the issues that we have heard previously from, from the trusts, can I ask any of you who, who feel able to pick this up, in terms of the provision of spaces, and Belfast Trust have indicated that there are 1,500 spaces short in the Belfast Trust area. And again, I believe that is the responsibility of decision makers, policy makers, trusts, not something that should be picked up by staff necessarily to cover that. But they have highlighted those capacity issues. How do you believe the trusts should more fairly and equitably address the capacity issues rather than charging? And just, 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 just as an example, we have we have heard from some of the trust around, and I think it has been mentioned there, 
uh, around potentially park and ride or whatever. But do, 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 are there any other are there other, other uh, indications that you think could be added into the mix here to uh, to to ensure that staff are not having to to meet the brunt of it? Yeah. Colin, I'll maybe just, ahead, I'll just be briefly there just to say, yeah, I mean, I think a colleague had mentioned earlier as well is that there are innovative ways. I mean, you mentioned just one was the, the, the park and ride, which was and was utilised quite successfully as well during um, the time of the, of the free parking. Um, but there, there certainly are. And we have been trying to engage with the trusts in terms of looking at alternative um, ways of um, uh, um providing the, the car parking i mean the reality is is that if you're paying the car parking space is there so if you're not paying the car parking space is still there it's just reality it comes down to who's who's funding it yeah okay thank you and in relation to the uh we, we've heard it we, we received evidence from the belfast trust not not only in relation to the the charges but actually indicating that they were considering raising and increasing the cost of parking what would your views be on that in light of the discussion that we've had i think that that, that would be totally unacceptable to us column so it would i mean certainly that within the belfast trust and we think that it's absolutely scandalous is that they have there is a proposal that they would extend the car parking to not just within the hospital sites but also within the health and well-being centers um, and that just is not acceptable to our members, to staff and uh, to patients who require the use of those uh, services from the health and wellbeing centres. Colin, could okay, I add to that? Just... Yeah, absolutely, John, go ahead. S sorry, I, I would just <clears throat> add further to that, that this, this would increase the inequity that currently exists, certainly when you look at what's happening in the Royal and some of the exemptions that they have in place, if they increase the car parking spaces, you know, you've got a bigger inequity gap um, between those who are exempt and those who aren't, who are terminally ill, who would have to pay higher rates as well. So, you know, we would not be supporting that and we would be strongly arguing against that. OK, um, and yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead, uh... Leandra, yeah, go ahead, please. Thanks, Callum. Um, I would just say that, you know, the Belfast Trust has some of the highest parking um, tariffs at £11 per day in the city hospital. So any increase would be, we just could not agree, agree to it. Um, and this probably, you know, this all comes down to funding. And we, we need to look and, and think innovatively. I mean, how much are we spending a year on agency spend? If we if we got on top of that, there would be well amount of money to be able to put it into car parking. You know, so we're we're able to find funds every year. What is it, two hundred million a year for agency spend? Yet we can't find funds for to pay for car parking. Yeah, I think we have seen in committee either projected figures or or I think we've seen well in excess of that. I think three hundred or three hundred and fifty million potentially being set aside for agency staff. Um, which is a, which is which is a well made point. Uh, okay, um, just let me check. Um, Colin, could I come in there? Yeah, okay. on... yeah go ahead, go ahead, Lars. Yeah. Just on the well, we I suppose we uh, the RCN were astounded to hear that the Belfast Trust were um, proposing to increase car parking costs, and as Leandra and, and others have said, that they have some of the highest costs. But the issue for the Belfast Trust, it has a serious recruitment and retention issue, uh, particularly in nursing. It is a regional centre, so a lot, a, lot, not, a lot of the nurses that work within the Belfast Trust are not on the doorstep of the Belfast Trust. Many of them come, like yourself, and, are, and, and if, if they were then forced to depend on public transport, it's just a no-goer. So it would be hugely concerning for the RCN that them costs are going to rise even further. OK, thank you. I will go then to members. So the first uh, indication I had there was from Alan. So go ahead, Alan, please. Uh, I've listened to all the speakers with interest and they've all made uh, uh, absolutely exceptional points. Um, uh, naturally, they, they all uh, support free uh, car parking for staff um, and I absolutely concur with that. I think it's a shame uh, that our health service staff uh, have to pay uh, for car parking. 
Also, uh, various speakers have highlighted the, the uh, differences in charges across the trusts, and uh, I would concur with that. I think that is, is totally unacceptable. Um, but I'm just wondering, uh, is there a full appreciation uh, among all the contributors that, that this bill has a, a twin approach? And uh, uh, you know, I know Dolores very early in her opening remarks said that she fully supports the bill. Um, but the, the, there's two elements in the bill, uh, and that is one to make uh, car parking free for staff, and the other element of the bill is to make uh, car parking free uh, for everybody who attends a hospital site for whatever reason, either as an outpatient, a visitor, or whatever. Uh, so the, that's the bit of the bill that uh, concerns me. Uh, the uh, Obviously, the unintended consequences of, of uh, the possibility of abuses. And we've also talked to speakers a bit about it's the availability, not only the charging to staff, but the availability of, of spaces uh, for staff. And uh, I think that if we do have an open house uh, uh, process where, where you can, anybody can come to a hospital site and park free for as long as they want, um, that is going to have a, a, a major impact uh, on the availability of, of spaces. Now, nobody uh, so far has satisfied me as to how uh, the abuses and the unintended consequences of free parking for all visitors to hospital sites can be controlled. Uh, and maybe I will, you know, I, I will be convinced of that when somebody actually brings me forward practical solutions uh, to that. Um, but the, um, the the unintended consequences, as I see it, are that um, patients actually are going to be impacted. People who are attending for treatment, uh, be it either long term cancer treatment or whatever. That if they come to the car park, uh, as it is, you go to the Royal site, you you could sit for up to 45 minutes to actually get into the car park. And it's very difficult for people to gauge how long it's going to take to actually arrive at the site and, and, and possibly be late for an outpatient appointment. I'm worried, uh, and I'd, I'd just be interested to hear what the, all the speakers could say in this, that, that outpatients might be inconvenienced and that uh, they will miss appointments or be absolutely late for appointments and that will disrupt the, the, the operation of, of the hospital. But uh, primarily I'd like to hear everybody's views on the free car parking right across the board, how they feel that can be controlled and if they feel that they, they accept that there could be uh, unintended consequences, but totally, totally support free car parking for all staff. Thank you. Okay. Chair, I'm happy to respond. Yeah, go ahead, Dolores. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Alan. And and and, and I do hear the question, and I, I do hear that you're you're looking for um, solutions. And I suppose from the Royal College of Nurses' point of view, uh, and, and and I'm not ducking it, but that's not really up to us to determine that. But and, and I do have a sympathy with uh, around the. Uh, unintended consequences for patients and ill patients and their and their relatives but the other the other side of the scale is the consequences that we currently face that our healthcare workers many of who are poorly paid that they face uh with these with these uh car parking charges so there's consequences for them as well which is then having a knock-on effect in, in, in many areas in recruitment and retention but the other thing that nursing that our members resent in terms of that argument is when 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 nurses are held up and told well you know uh if we abolish car parking charges there'll be a cut in patient services and that is um one uh one viewpoint that nurses absolutely um resent and are offended by um so um they, they object to being told if they get free car parking that patients will suffer and this type of flawed, flawed logic has been used for years with nursing staff particularly around conversations about uh, uh, agreeing fair pay uh, when nurses have been underpaid for years so I do hear what you're saying I do think it's up to others to determine how we get around this and in, in, and in today's world of IT and passes and 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 all of the other things it's about I would have thought um, that uh, trust could come up with solutions 
But if, uh, I mean, if the authorities announced uh, tomorrow that car parking uh, charges for all staff across the, the, the boards was to be abolished uh, and that you wouldn't have that worry anymore, uh, uh, the totally unacceptable worry of having to pay the park to come to work. So if the authorities announced that tomorrow, would you all uh, be campaigning, continuing to campaign for free car parking uh, for everyone who attends a, uh, a hospital site? So I'll maybe go to Leandra. I see Leandra's hand up for to, in relation to the previous one. So maybe Leandra can maybe pick up from there and dip back, dip back to the previous one of you, Leandra. Thanks, Chair. Um, just moving on from Dolores' comments, you know, there are a number of innovative ways that they can control car parks, even if they're free, like the validation of tickets if you're visiting or a patient or QR codes on, a, on appointment letters. So you can only utilise the car park if you scan your code. Um, I think we need to look to what they've done in Scotland and Wales. They've been doing this for 12, 13 years. And you know they will have things in place to control car parks. So I think you know we have to we have to look for the learning acro across the water. Um, I'm sure they have mechanisms. Um, and just moving on from Dolores's point about you know we're always always being told there'll be a cut in service um, if we don't have the funds for the car parking. Um, but I would ask all of you in the health committee and all your MPs to use your position to get us increased resources and funding for Northern Ireland so that we can get funding to put back into services. Um, so that would be an ask from us. OK, thank you. OK, Alan, is there anyone else on the panel want to come in briefly on any of that before I move on? No. Alan, are you happy enough then, or anything further from you briefly? Well, I, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really sure if uh, nobody has really responded to my question that if uh, all staff got free parking tomorrow morning, uh, would they still uh, all collectively be campaigning for free car parking uh, for every visitor to uh, a hospital site? Okay, well, I think I think the panel have have answered um, in 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 the way that they are in the way that they are comfortable with. So unless anyone's indicating, I'll move on to the next question. No, okay, okay. So I'm going then to Deborah. Go ahead, Deborah. Sorry, I just had a wee bit of um a wee bit of a delay there in in our meetings. But um, thank you for the evidence that we have uh, just heard. Um, personally speaking, um, the arguments on both sides are very finely balanced, uh, you know, in my view. Um, but I do take on board fully the points that have been made today, and I think they've been very uh, well put forward. You know, the current postcode lottery in terms of the rates of charging, concessions and exemptions, you know, do breed uh, inequality. And it's bad for morale and not in keeping with the ethos, you know, of the health service, you know, which is free at the point of access. Um. I'm interested to hear from Dolores and Leandra on this. Um, you know, do you, do your organisations believe that car parking charges are instrumental in attracting skills and expertise to the health service? Are the core terms and conditions not more likely to have, um, you know, greater bearing on recruitment and retention? And I, I totally uh, agree with Leandra's points there in terms of agency nursing and things like that because we have been um, delving into that and I know I've been asking the minister in relation to that aspect of things. Um, and then my next question is, um, what conditions uh, or, or patient categories are currently excluded from trust exemptions for charging? And I understand that some trusts differ. And then lastly, uh, Joan, you touched on the differences in terms of how trust operates in terms of the free parking. Um, has there been any discussion uh, about informing standardised criteria for parking exemptions or related policies across trust premises? I know there's a lot of questions in yeah. there, but um, uh, if you can touch on some of those, please. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to come in first, Chair. Um, 
and, and, and the first question was around the recruitment and retention. Um, and did we believe that car parking had a bearing on that? And I suppose, well, you know, car parking's been around and the debate around has, has been around for years. It comes and goes, but it never goes away. Uh, so do, do we believe that it has a bearing? So at this minute in time, our, our members describe it as a as an additional tax on going to work. So it's, we're driving to work and then we're being paid, as for some cases, up to £60 a week uh, out of, out of you know, low wages. So our members are telling us, particularly those on the lower pay bands, that it does have a bearing on, 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 their, on their decisions. And, you know, it does have a bearing on the very recent pay award. Um, <clears throat> at, you know, whatever... Whatever benefit they may have realized realize from the the recent pay award announced at the end of November, car parking charge does erode that. So um, our members are telling us yes, it does. It absolutely does. So that was one part of your question, Deborah. Um, uh, I don't know if Leander, you want to come in on on that as well. Yeah, just in relation to recruitment and in retention. Um, yeah, it definitely does have a bar and, you know, it is an additional tax that they have to pay for. Um, and I would say to you, you know, MLAs, Department of Health staff all have free car parking. So why is there that inequality there with our health service staff? Um, I know, Deborah, you said about what patients are exempt. I know that in some trusts, it's um, patients undergoing cancer treatment or those that have children that are, are in hospital um, are able to avail of free car parking. I know for a fact that, you know, anybody undergoing radiotherapy or chemotherapy treatment would be given free car parking as it is. And it's, you know, it works really well. I, I was a therapy radiographer myself in Belfast and we, we just validated tickets every week and they were given a ticket and they could get in and out of the car park, no problem. Deborah, if you want, I'll answer specifically some of the questions around people um, impacted by terminal illness. So we haven't heard of anything about standardising the exemptions at all, um, but it's highlighted in the paper there, um, and um, Leandra already mentioned about um, patients who were receiving radiotherapy and chemotherapy or one of the discretions, um, renal dialysis and the critical care high dependency um, uh, within the Royal. So that's what's currently there and I suppose my point earlier was around you know it excludes for example many other terminal illnesses like chronic respiratory diseases and advanced neurological conditions like dementia etc so what we are really saying is that there's already an inequity there and you know it needs to be addressed and the bill offers an opportunity to um, address those inequities and I would reiterate um, some of the points that have already been made that um, I think the full consequences of um, the outworkings of this need to really be analysed fully and costed fully because obviously there will be knock-on implications as well, certainly um, uh, with, any of, with any of the proposals. But um, And I would be also looking, as somebody else mentioned, so I'll look at models of best practice and what they're doing elsewhere, but they've already done this, um, you know, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel here, but I think we need to bottom them out fully because there are a number of issues that need to be addressed. And I would say we need to be very careful if we if we look at a, at a halfway house as well. We do not want, under any circumstances, to add to the inequity and make it any greater or, or any worse for, for any particular groups of people. Okay, thank you. Thank, yeah. thank you. Just check there's a number of questions. Have you have they all been covered for you? Yeah, I, I, I just wonder, um, maybe just you know, do it's just trying to see whether you know it is a car parking charges or you know, would better rates of pay and things like that for staff not be more beneficial? You know, in terms of car parking, or is it the the fact that the two go hand in hand really? Um, you know, that's what I'm trying to bottom out. And, and you know, everything does come down to budgets. Um, it does come down to money. And would there be any concerns, I suppose, because the argument is on the other side that, you know, car parking charges are revenue raising. And so would there be any concerns that we are maybe going to be stripping, 
um some of that money away from frontline services as well so sorry chair that that will be my final question thank you okay so does anyone want to pick up on that please I suppose. I commit, yes, I'm sorry, Tanya, you go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead, Leandra. It's grand. Um, I think they're very. They're two very separate issues. Our pay and um, ho you know, hospital car parking charges, and they need to be kept very separate. Deborah, um, in relation to um, you know, where's the budget going to come from? Um, and we're we're stripping services in England. Car parking provides two hundred million. And they're able, you know, they are going to be bringing in um, abolishment of, of car parking fees. So they're able to find that money in Scotland and Wales. I'm sure it was exactly the same. So, again, it's about looking across the way to see what they have done and see that how they have funded, you know, when they have lost that revenue. Thank you, Tanya. Go ahead, please. Um, no, uh, Colm, I was going to make just exactly the same point, is that th that we don't see them as being, um, th they're two very separate issues, Deborah, I suppose, from our point of view. Um, so I've just been reiterating the Andrew's points. Okay, thank you. So I will move on then to Colin. McGrath. Go ahead, Colin, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the um, thank you to the uh, panel for their um, pr presentation today. Um, look, I, I'm one of these people that just sees this um, hospital charges as a stealth tax on staff. I also think that it is a stealth tax on those that are using the services, and as has been referenced. Um, the, the National Health Service at its core is free at the point of delivery, but it's not if you're having to try and find change to go out into a car park and feed a meter. And, and that's I just don't think it's acceptable. Um, I also just want to uh, put on record as well, Chair, I really don't accept this point that there's a mass amount of people that are using car parking uh, spaces mm. and then using it as a park and ride. I, I don't see huge amounts of people parking at the Ulster Hospital if it was free so that they could go into the city centre to go to Primark and other places. There are many other places that they can go to that are much closer uh, where they could avail of free parking. Um, and I don't think that we should be allowing that to be a smokescreen. There may be one or two um, individual circumstances, but again, that has been referenced. There are technological ways that you could work around site-specific problems, and I really don't think that the trusts have taken um, the sort of corporate decision that they want to try and remove the charges, and in so doing, looking at alternatives. I think they've just accepted that it's easy just to charge for them. Um, and I also um, know that there are places like, for example, the Down Hospital in Downpatrick, near to myself, where it is uh, free. The Ulster Hospital it isn't, but there's been quite a number of services moved from the Down to um, the Ulster Hospital and that means that that's an extra burden on people because they have to follow where the services are going uh, and can be quite unfair. But I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask maybe about the staff and, and the impact on them and I know that there's been reference to the park and ride facilities but I can't help but think that if you're a staff member that's done a 12-hour shift and then you have to go outside and you have to wait on a bus and the bus has to bring you several miles down the road and then you have to get into your car and you're maybe starting your journey home a half an hour after you've actually finished your shift, that that somehow or another doesn't feel fair. And I would just maybe like to hear what the panel think about that in terms of is it really fair that staff have to use off-site uh, facilities and wait around on buses? And then maybe just that element about services being relocated from one site to another. Um, how much of an impact uh, and what is maybe people's feedback from staff if they have to move their job, they maybe were relocated somewhere and then they really have to be relocated to somewhere where they then have to pay car parking charges. How is that managed and how does staff feel about that? Okay, I'm, I'm happy to come in. Yeah, go ahead, Dolores. Uh, okay, Colin, thank you for that. Um, and in terms of the, the park and rides, and even if we want to broaden it out to um, public transport, um, that really um, hits a note with nursing. And if you just think of the nursing uh, work, the nursing workforce, and it's a predominantly female workforce. That's the first thing, and this is what our members are telling us. So, predominantly female workforce. Many of them are young mothers, are people with caring responsibilities. So, if you're heading out at half six or seven in the morning to start a twelve-hour shift with two kids to drop off at the crash, or the childminder, 
the public transport is totally out of the equation. It's not an option. Neither is a park and ride. And you know, and our members are telling us, like, for me to use public transport, and that's uh, not necessarily female uh, members either, but people just telling us to use public transport, it, it adds another hour onto their their commute. So there may be some place there for park and rides for for maybe people that work a nine to five. That's not for me to decide, but it certainly isn't at all suitable for shift workers and then there's the other dangers of their safety at night and, and and moving back and forward to these parking rides so the parking rides might solve a bit of the problem but there's certainly huge issues there for shift workers um and in terms of the redeployment colin you're absolutely right redeployment was one of the probably one of the biggest challenges for nursing staff over the past 20 months during the pandemic and and it did raise lots of challenges uh, for members in terms of getting recompensed for additional travel and getting recompensed if, 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 if car parking charges hadn't been uh, um, where, where the, in, 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 their, in their base or their normal place of work. So there, so there were challenges around there that, that, were, that, that were taken through uh, the normal trade union processes. Colin, can I just add a point? Yes, well, Colin, um, the other issue with the park and ride is it doesn't take account really for those members of staff who actually need their car to discharge their duties, such as social workers and social care staff, you know. So um, that, that, that's, that has to be uh, considered. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you, Colin. Actually, I will just take the opportunity of that break just to reiterate my own interest there, just for clarity, that I have previously been a social worker and remain on a on a career break with one of the trusts in, in that in that regard. So just to be clear about that. But also, I suppose I just do want to say briefly that I find it a wee bit strange that we're we're talking about the inequities and the challenges and, and the the, uh, the the unfairness in many ways. And I think Generally speaking, to expect the people who are the subject of those inequities and unfairness to first of all come up with a solution before it would be addressed or removed strikes me as a bit strange. I don't think it's any more the place of staff representatives to come up with the solutions than it is for staff members to pay for the parking or to pay for the lack of capacity that exists within the system or to pay with the lack of planning to deal with, with capacity. So I just, I just want to say that very, very clearly. Um, Paula, go ahead, please. You're next there. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for the update today. I, I suppose quite a lot of the questions I were going through in my head have already been addressed, so no, I really appreciate your contributions this morning. I suppose there was the one that was sort of um, jumped out at me, and I think it was from Leandra, uh, and that was in, in relation to the um, allied health professionals potentially having multiple appointments during the day. And I suppose I should know the answer to this, but w w would some of those a AHPs be appointed by different trusts? So, you know, they would have quite a distance to travel between the these appointments, or, they, or it would just be Belfast? Thank you. Thanks, Paula. So I was talking about the likes of physiotherapists that maybe would be coming in and out of car parks. So they would be going out to the community. They may go back to their base to get further equipment and then go back out to another appointment in the community. So essentially they're accessing the car parks in and out and, and they may be paying, you know, increased fees for that because they're not staying in the car park all day for a shift. Okay, no problem. I'll clear it up. Thank you. And I suppose I, I did like your suggestion there um, around the validation of the parking codes on, on the letter. And I think that the, the chair has, has, has hit the nail on the head there that it really shouldn't be up to yourselves to be providing the, the solutions. And I think that would be one that would be very workable. But no, thank you to all of you for your contributions and I've read your submissions. So appreciate your time thank on those. You. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And moving on to Carol Lee Cullen, Ladera Election de Kest, Carol Ledeho. Gormagi Carly, thank you, panel, um, for your attendance today at the committee. Um, first of all, just to say on the record that we have campaigned for more money for Westminster for health and social care and will continue to, even when others scoffed. Um, and we've been steadfast in our support in terms of health and social care receiving the bulk of the budget because that's where the need is so just want to put that on the record and you're at, you're absolutely right we we do as indeed has the bill sponsor raise the issue that not just the mlas 
but officials from all over the state and Stormont enjoy free car parking. I want to ask, um, and this has been largely covered, but in relation to um, retention, we, we hear a lot about recruitment, retention of staff, but certainly there are big concerns and the chairs raised this in relation to retention of staff. You know, would um, forcing or, or certainly not supporting free car parking for health and social care staff actually impact on retention? That's my first question. And the second one is that just given the fact that a lot of um, deployment, redeployment, particularly for certain specialities of nurses, they've been sent all over and happy to do so, but at a personal and financial cost to themselves. Um, what what representations, um, other than what the bill is doing, will be made um, in terms of greater support for health and social care staff, not only just in parking, but certainly, like I, I, I'll tell you about the car park in the matter, it may be the cheapest in Belfast, but it's 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 not, I don't feel safe going to it at night. It's very poorly lit, it's tucked away up in the back and it's it's quite creepy, right? So for us, it isn't just about the car parking, it's about improving the, um, while this is about free car parking, we also are raising with the trusts about improving the services for people using cars and sure I'll finish in this. I don't think it's up to nurses or any other member staff to prove the car parking may or may not be abused. I think that's down to the trust and the general public. But given the fact that a lot of people are having to work shifts and drop and drop kids and all off, is it really fair in this day and age, particularly what we've went through, that some staff are been asked to pay up to eleven pound a day, particularly in the city hospital. So that's that's just my questions and observations, Chair. Yep. Yeah, okay, Chair. Thank you. So I go back to the panel for the questions elements out of that. Um, could someone indicate who wants to pick that up in relation to retention? Yeah, Dolores. In relation to the impact on retention. Okay. Um, thank you, Carla, and thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to retention, I suppose um, when I was reflecting on this conversation today, I, I, I have thought long and hard about that, and, and our members, as I said earlier, would um, would cite this as a retention issue. You know, if something's going to hit your pocket to the tune of, in some cases, £60 a week, it would make you think, do I want to go and work there, or will I try and get a job down the road where they don't charge me for parking? And I think that's, you know, we have a huge recruitment and retention within the Belfast area, so it has to be uh, a factor worthy of consideration. The other thing as well is at this minute in time, the RCN has asked the health minister to look at a retention strategy and that work has started. And I would have thought this would be something that would feature within that strategy when we're trying to think of ways in which we can make the overall package more attractive to, to retain our staff. Our issue is primarily retention in Northern Ireland, not maybe so much recruitment, particularly for nursing. We can get the nurses in, but we, we have a serious uh, retention issue at the minute. So. So, Carol, I definitely do think it's, it definitely features in there. So that was one part of your question in terms of our representations. And in terms of our representations on, on car park again and safety, we've been making representations for years on this. Uh, you know, we probably have a paper trail that would take us back. Uh, and, and I think um, all my trade union colleagues will say the same. Um, so I don't know, Carla, if that answers you or not. Colin. Could I just add a point, point there as well, is that I, I had mentioned earlier is that the trusts undertake um, exit interviews for staff that are leaving. And this isn't just antidotal evidence. This is this is factual evidence is that staff are saying that they are leaving, for instance, particularly the Belfast Trust, where, as colleagues have said, that some of the charges are extremely high. So they are. So they're leaving the trusts to go to a trust five miles up the road, maybe, um, that don't have the same car parking charges. So it, there definitely is the evidence there that people are not remaining in jobs because of, of particularly of um, uh, car parking issues. Uh, however, I, I would say as well, that there, there's a number 
of other elements around the retention of staff that really need to be picked up on, but certainly car parking does have an impact. Yeah. Do anyone else want to comment on that in relation to impact on their on the, the staff they represent? Yes, uh, go ahead, just, please. Just um, one final yeah, point. Um, you know, inflation's at 5.4% and it's uh, currently rising. Um, and, you know, our members will have to make decisions regarding pr to prioritise spending. And it may be that, you know, I'll go and work in a different hospital because I'm going to save in the region of maybe £200 a month because I'll maybe not have to pay for parking. So, you know, car parking, abolishing the fees is a way of letting the health service staff feel valued. That's all I'd like to say. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, and uh, so I move, and, and and also I suppose you know we are conscious. Um, all of us in terms of of the assembly, I think, are conscious of the very great pressures of cost of living as well. In terms of of all the other pressures that families and workers are under at the present time. But I'll go then to Jerry Carroll. Uh, Emily, go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, panel, as well. Uh, just two quick points on the question. Uh, I think there's a bit of a false debate here around saying it's either better rates of pay uh, and free parking. Uh, I think there was a debate on this committee a few months ago uh, where some of the members uh, proposing um, an opposition to free parking were opposed to better rates of pay for health workers. So I think there's a contradiction uh, and a bit of double speak uh, going on there that needs to uh, be challenged and, and called out. I think it's possible to have better rates of pay for all health workers and they deserve far more than the below inflation offer that are given uh, by the executive now. And it's also possible to have free parking for all staff and all uh, patients as well. So I think that needs to be a narrative, needs to be firmly, strongly uh, challenged. Um, and maybe just, I think Tanya was, or, or somebody touched upon the, the fact that health workers have had a real term pay cut for years. There's another one now they're, they're being faced with. So uh, maybe to, to come back on how uh, the fact that they're being charged uh, for parking as well, how that is impacting on, on staff financially, but also in more always. Um, the other point I wanted to raise is, uh, I mean, we're, we're hearing this uh, narrative um, from from some uh, trust representatives last week and on chambers can refer to it uh, in passing as well. This idea that people are just um, you know, driving up to hospitals and, or they would do and, and park there because it's free. Um, I mean, I think that's just completely inaccurate and, and a fallacy that doesn't exist. Uh, if, if any um, of the panelists can can speak to that, I mean, my experience, I I work. Um, I live right next to the Royal Victoria Hospital as well. That is the biggest uh, workplace uh, in the west of the city. So if people are, are trying to park there uh, for free or trying to get a space, then where, where are they going to? I asked it last week and nobody could give a, a, a clear answer. So maybe people can speak to that. And also my experience is because of the costs incurred by um, health workers, uh, we have a situation where some health workers are parking in, in streets um, near to the hospital, uh, but it's causing you know some friction between residents uh, because you know in already built up streets, people are parking on curbs and places where normally they wouldn't. Uh, and I don't blame health workers for this, but the reality is because of the cost in uh, parking charges, there's a bit of friction and tension there among some residents and health workers. So maybe uh, people um, can speak to that. Um, and yeah, so I just think that idea that you know people will. Or they did during COVID when uh, fees were were waived. People parked in hospitals just for a crack uh, isn't the state of play that I've experienced, uh, uh, and the trust have no evidence of it. So if anybody could speak to that um, as well, that would be so. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Are you yeah. coming in there? Yeah. Yeah. Jerry, I would absolutely agree with the points that you have made there. I don't think that there is any evidence whatsoever. Um, and I, I think just you, you referred there to people, uh, to staff and uh, workers having to park in the streets. And that does, uh, you know, certainly cause some contention. But there's also the issue of people parking and then have had their cars um, mm. vandalized as well. Like, you know, so that's an additional cost then for workers to get their cars repaired. But I absolutely agree with you. I think that the narrative in terms of the pay issue as well has to change is that they're two very, very separate issues. 
Thank you. And are, are there other elements of Jerry's question there that anyone wants to pick up on or comments to make? Jerry, are you content there that, that your questions have all been covered? Just, I mean, I think kind of touched upon it, but just, just quickly, just on the idea that, you know, people will, uh, you know, park in, in hospitals, um, like I said, for the crack, uh, if, if charges uh, are, are waived. Again, there was no evidence presented. I asked um, a representative from one of the, it was the Belfast Trust last week, was there any evidence of this, that this would happen? Um, they said that there wouldn't. So, um, you know, if anybody has any further comment on that, that would be useful. But uh, aside from that, that's that's me. I don't believe, Jerry, that there is any evidence. I think that's why the Belfast Trust were not able to provide it, is that it's very anecdotal. So it is like, you know, that people would, but I would agree with you. And in terms of some of the, I mean, the uh, Royal Victoria Hospital is one example, but right across, like, you know, so it doesn't actually marry up. So it doesn't, what they're saying. So I, I would agree. I don't think there's evidence there. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you, Colin. Okay, thank you, um, and thank you. I don't see any other indications from members there, so I, I just want, I suppose, to, to, to just briefly, in terms of, um, I, I do I do think that some of the evidence we've received has been quite quite hard-hitting, I have to say, despite despite the fact that it's it's been, in some ways, matter of fact, and, and, and there are facts there, and, and there are impacts, but the idea, like as, as we have seen in an evidence there from Marie Curie, hospital, in, and they are inescapable, Hospital car parking charges represent an extra cost imposed on dying people and their loved ones when they can least afford it. Um, allied health professionals, car parking charges are essentially a tax on the sick and some of the most vulnerable in society. And indeed from the unions that the abolition of charges would be a real term show of recognition of critical work staff undertake. And it would also critically help the recruitment and retention of staff. And I think those, those are important and valid issues. Um, to be reflected on. I will also just reiterate the fact that, that I don't think the people on whom the inequity is currently placed should have to prove uh, that or, or demonstrate or design a system that would address it. I also think it's very interesting and has been mentioned several times around the Scotland, Wales and indeed England are moving towards that position. So clearly these things can be done. So returning to my opening remarks, the issues of how you control it and who pays for it need addressed. But it's not up. It's not up to. Uh, it's not up to staff to decide how that gets controlled. But clearly, there are ways of doing that. I think that's that's been clear, and we are hoping to get. I think some further documents in in relation to the Scottish and Welsh models, um, and then you're down to the issue of income, and and indeed, as as was indicated last week, almost a loss of revenue. Again, that's not up to staff to subsidise security or subsidise lighting. Staff are entitled to go to their work. And be able to park and, and do their urgent and important work that we all respect and um, state our respect for. But but this would be a measure that would show some practical implications of that. So I would like to thank you for attending today's committee and um, wish you, you and, and, and the people you represent all the very best in the time ahead. Please take care, be safe, and please accept our appreciation and acknowledgement of the efforts that you have been doing way before this pandemic struck and to some degree of a, a huge degree of pressure throughout the entire pandemic and we do appreciate and acknowledge your efforts in every year thank you thanks very much chair yeah. thank you thanks chair. Very much. bye bye bye, bye. okay thank you members so um okay members we will then um Claire, can you just can you just clarify that there is a, a reuse document being being worked on at present, or what's the situation with that? Yes, sure. I'm um, discussing with um, Reuse about the document and what it might involve. But I'm going to send members also. There's a, a Westminster research paper's been done um, on the issue as well, so I'll get that sent out to members for information. Um, but we're we're currently working on what um, a paper might look like and. Um, the, the issues that it would look like as, as well. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. So I will move on then, members, to um, our next item on the agenda is item eight, which is a draft SR. Um, now, this is the draft SR uh, in relation to the Coronavirus Act 2020, Extension of Powers to Act for the Protection of Public Health, Order, 
NA 2021. So members, that is the that is the one that you will recall was deferred from last week um, and maybe deferred from previous week as well. It's This is the underpinning legislation that provides the public health measures that have been used in relation to the pandemic. The department has advised that it intends to withdraw this SR. A decision on a date for the draft order to be relayed has not been made. Now, I have to say that that causes me quite some degree of concern because I, I think from my perspective, we are still dealing with this pandemic. And while it certainly is great that there, that there are signs at the minute that things may be improving, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are able to react to any circumstances. And if COVID-19 has taught us one thing, it's that things can change rapidly within a matter of hours, days and weeks. And the need to respond rapidly also remains the case. And I think we all look forward to a day when we can look back and say that, that COVID-19 now is being managed. But at this point in time, when, when there are medical and scientific uh, predictions that there will be at least a further surge in the summer and others, I would be concerned that, uh, that, that as to, as to the, the, the rationale for withdrawing this, I have to say, and I think we should write and ask the department to urgently clarify why they have withdrawn this today and what they are planning to do in terms of in terms of moving forward in relation to this. Because, you know, we're, we're still, as, as an assembly and as a committee and as a Department of Health, we're still dealing, dealing with COVID-19. And people, I think, understand that. But I think we need to ensure that we have the required legislative tools uh, in place that can respond quickly to any further threats or any further measures appropriately. So I think an urgent, an urgent explanation from the department is needed here. Um, would members agree? And I'll, I'll take members in for comment as well. Um, if members wish to come in, Deborah, you're indicating there. Yes, thank you, Chair. I don't um, disagree in getting further information from the Department of Health, but I mean, my understanding is that you know the current powers that are in place are due to expire on the twenty fourth of March. Um, I just lack understanding as to why the minister is bringing or was due to bring it forward at, at this juncture um, and maybe there would be more merit in evaluating the situation as we move towards you know in the latter parts of our middle of February and um, before March rather than, than now so I, I suppose there's a lack of clarity around uh, some of this as well Chair um, but I'm happy to hear from, from other mm -hmm. members in relation to that I'm just my query would be around the timing um although I come from a different position of you from you um just I think there would be merit in evaluating the situation yeah thanks Deborah so I have Paula and then I have Alan go ahead Paula um, thank you, Chair. I very much concur with, with your comments. Concern, I suppose, it, it's the wider public that I'm thinking of in relation to this issue keep being deferred week on week. We're all receiving the emails from people who are asking us to vote one way or the other in terms of the extension of the Coronavirus Act. And I, I think that we should really impress upon the department the urgency with which we need a response as to their rationale for, for keep deferring it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I agree, Paula. Anything that undermines public confidence or understanding of the need for and the application of the amendments is a concern as well. And I think we need consistency and we need to be honest and upfront and we need to be guided by the scientific and medical evidence. Um, so, Alan? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering if, if the Minister's and the Department's uh, urgency in bringing this forward uh, rather than waiting to the middle of February or, or, or the end of February uh, is maybe related to the possibility that uh, Mr. Donaldson uh, is going to possibly uh, withdraw his minister or ministers uh, from the executive uh, and that uh, might lead to the collapse of the assembly and that uh, therefore this extremely important piece of legislation um, uh, wouldn't be uh, have, have passed through the assembly. So. I think uh, that 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 might be there might be a level of thinking uh, in the department uh, around that uh, potential aspect. 
Well, possibly, I would have thought that would have been an indication of a need to press on with it, but regardless, whatever about the collapse of the Assembly, and that would be deplorable, I think, in itself, the collapse of these laws by default, um, if they were needed again, would be absolutely, fundamentally, um, you know, a, 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 an abrogation of, of, of the duty we all have to ensure that, the, that there are measures available to be taken. Um, Jerry, I'll go to yourself. Yeah, thanks. Sure, I have no issue seeking the rationale from the minister and the officials for for withdrawing. Um, but also, I think we need to ascertain, um, you know, if this uh, isn't extended, uh, these powers, what other method or powers have the department and the minister to make uh, regulations and, and laws? Because, you know, I have no issue with um, protection um, and measures to protect people from COVID. I've been one of the most vocal ones and measures being lifted too early without enough evidence. Um, but I also have concern about the way uh, some of the regulations have been made, as in they've been made, there's been no debate, and then three, four weeks later, whatever it has been, there's been a vote in the Assembly. And in some cases, the regulation were um, sub, uh, superseded uh, by other. So I think there's a problem around process, around how um, the regulations are changed. So if we can, either in a separate uh, or an additional um, to your letter uh, proposed share, find out what other mechanisms has the department uh, to make legislation um, aside from the ex extension uh, of this powers or in the light of the, the powers aren't, aren't extended, if that uh, is clear. Okay, thank you. So are members content with with, uh, with those those uh, broad proposals? And Clerk, are you clear enough on what has been uh, requested there by committee? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, members. So, um, members, just before I go to the next one, which we will have officials to brief us on the next SR on the misuse of drugs, I would propose just take a very short five minute break there, five maybe seven minute break, just to uh, allow a break for members to return at a twelve twenty, please twelve twenty, and we'll resume there with the next briefing. Thank you. And Claire, could you just confirm when we are off the session? Thank you. That's members offline now, Chair.
Hi hey, Chair, that's us back on live again. Okay, and can I just check that you're hearing me okay, Keith? Yes, hearing you, Grand Chair. Thank you. Okay, members, so thank you. Uh, we're moving on to item 9 then, SR uh, 2021342, which is um, in relation to the misuse of drugs, Amendment Number 2, Regulations NA 2021. I refer members to tab 9 of your pack and can advise members that departmental officials are here to brief the committee on the provisions of this SOR, which controls the use of certain substances. So I'd now like to welcome uh, Mr. Kenneth Ward, who's head of medicines in the regulatory branch. Kenneth, can you hear us okay? Uh, yes, sir, thanks. Thanks, Kenneth. So hearing you there fine. Also, Aaron McKendry, who's principal pharmaceutical officer. Can you hear me okay, Aaron? I can indeed, sir, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Isabel Riddell, who's Deputy Principal in Medicines in the Policy Branch. And I think by Isabel's smile, I've got the pronunciation of that surname wrong. Uh, can you hear us? And would you like to amend, please, Isabel? Uh, yes, sir, I'm here and I can hear you. And it was fine. It's Riddell. Isabel Riddell. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Michael Harkin, who's Policy Officer with the Health De Development Policy Branch. New Year's okay. Can indeed. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. So I will then go back to yourself, Kenneth, just as first name on my list here, to see is it yourself that's doing the opening remarks before we go to members' questions? Uh, call my up, Chair. I'm going to pass to Isabel. Uh, Isabel, I'll give the brief initial briefing, please. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Isabel. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to brief the Health Committee today on the statutory rule um, that's in front of you entitled The Misuse of Drugs Amendment No. 2 Regs, Northern Ireland 2021. It was laid on the 15th of December 2021 to align with the Home Office laying date for a statutory instrument to amend their equivalent misuse of drugs legislation. By way of background, I'll quickly outline how dangerous or harmful drugs are controlled under primary and subordinate legislation and the purpose of the statutory rule that's before you today. The UK-wide Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, which I will refer to as the 1971 Act from here on, controls drugs that are dangerous or otherwise harmful. And Schedule 2 to the 1971 Act specifies these drugs and groups them under three categories. Part 1 lists Class A drugs, Part 2 lists Class B drugs, and Part 3 Class C drugs. The classification provides a framework within which criminal penalties are set. The Act is UK-wide legislation and any changes to it are taken through Parliament and will apply to all UK regions. The legitimate use of controlled drugs is permitted through the Misuse of Drugs Regulations Northern Ireland 2002. GB has separate regulations called the Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001. However, both sets of regulations define the classes of person who are authorised to possess and supply controlled drugs while acting in their professional capacity. Controlled drugs are classified into five schedules based on an assessment of their medicinal or therapeutic usefulness, the need for legitimate access and their potential harms when misused. Different levels of control apply with Schedule 1 being the most tightly controlled and Schedule 5 the least tightly controlled. The Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, um, I will refer to as the ACMD from here on, was set up under the 1971 Act as an independent body which provides advice to government about the harm and misuse of drugs that could create a problem in today's society. <clears throat> the ACMD makes recommendations to government on the control of these drugs, including classification under the 1971 Act that I mentioned and scheduling under its Misuse of Drugs regulations. Following criminal cases involving the use of gamma hydroxybutyrate or GHB, as I will refer to it from here home, and in particular, the high profile case of Renhard Sinaga, a serial rapist who was convicted of 159 sex offences, including 136 rapes of young men between 2015 and 17 in Manchester, where he was living as a student. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, called for a review of controls for drugs like GHB. The ACMD carried out that review of GHB and related substances, including gamma-butrolactone, I would refer to as GBL from here on, 
and gamma butane DO, which I will refer to as 1,4-BD, and both of these are the subject they are named in the SR before you, which are all central nervous system depressants and which can cause profound unconsciousness. GHB has medicinal value in the treatment of, for example, narcolepsy. GBL and 1,4-BD are used in industry in the manufacturing of many products, such as cleaning products, uh, paint thinners and solvents. However, once ingested, they convert quickly to GHB in the body. Although it is sometimes referred to as a date rape drug, GHB is also illicitly used recreationally and consensually among certain groups. The ACMD reported the findings of their review in November 2020, which included there was an increase in evidence of physical, mental and social health harms related to GHB and related substances misuse, which can include death in the most extreme cases, particularly with other drugs involved and alcohol. The ACMD also found that the illicit use of GHB related substances imposes uncompensated costs on wider society, including the physical and emotional trauma caused by the crime, the costs incurred by the healthcare services used by the victims, and the costs incurred by the criminal justice system to bring those criminals and drug users to justice. So the ACMD made a number of recommendations to tighten restrictions and reduce unlawful access to the compounds that I've named, including that GHB, GBL and 1,4-BD should be moved from Class C to Class B of the 1971 Act, thereby increasing the maximum penalty for unlawful possession. And in order to take that forward, an order in council to move these drugs from Class B uh, sorry, to Class B across the UK was laid on the 15th of December 2021 and subject to parliamentary approval, this is expected to come into force mid-2022 and that was laid by our Home Office colleagues. The ACMD also recommended that GHB should remain under Schedule 2 to the Misuse of Drugs Regulations and the GBL and 1,4-BD should be placed under Schedule 1 of the regulations and that their legitimate industrial uses are made subject to a controlled drugs licensing regime. So the SR, which is before the committee, is necessary to implement the advice from the ACMD for amendments to the Northern Ireland misuse of drugs legislation. The SR will schedule GBL and 1,4-BD under Schedule 1 of our regulations, and this aims to prevent these substances being available for misuse and criminal activity. And the statute will also remove an exemption from the misuse of drugs regulations that made certain activities in relation to GBL and 1,4-BD lawful. And this means that legitimate industrial users in Northern Ireland will now require a controlled drug licence. Under this amendment, businesses seeking to import, export, possess, supply or produce GBL and 1,4-BD will need to apply for a licence to do so. The SR will keep Northern Ireland in line with GB, otherwise there would be a disparity in the controls relating to these dangerous substances and therefore a potential health and safety risk to members of the public and NI. I'd like to point out that the period sorry, between laying the strategy rule on the 15th of December and the coming into operation date, which is the 15th of June 2022, is six months. Um, this was deliberate and it's an extended period to enable legitimate industrial users of GBL and 1,4-BD to apply for and subject to an assessment of their application be granted a controlled drugs licence as required by the statutory rule. Alignment of the lane and coming into operation dates will maintain parity and ensure that all UK industry users will have the same period within which to make that application for a licence. Information provided by the Home Office from the Chemical Industries Association and Confederation of British Industry about usage within the chem chemical industry suggests there are approximately 65 industrial users of these substances across the UK, none of which are in Northern Ireland. However, a licence will be a requirement for any new Northern Ireland industrial users of these substances from June 2022 when the SR comes into operation. In terms of communication of these amendments, we've provided input into a draft UK-wide circular for issue to industry, setting out the effects of the amendments, including the licensing requirements. 
So that, that's the briefing for today, Chair. I'd like to thank you, the, you and the committee again for the opportunity to provide the further information. So can us to answer any questions members might have related to the strategy rule? And Michael is here to answer any questions from a wider health devol development policy perspective. And Michael's uh, branch leads on the cross-government strategy to reduce harm from substance misuse in Northern Ireland. And that's why he's joined us today. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Isabel. And uh, thank you for a very comprehensive, actually. That was that was very enlightening, I have to say, um, in relation to the in relation to the issues and, and the impacts of, of the actual products. I know the committee has considered a number of these before, and I think um I know certainly on my own behalf, uh, we're 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 quite glad to see that these things are being monitored and tightened up on appropriately and, and, and so no issue with that at all. I suppose the only issue I wanted a couple of brief things to ask you in relation to it. Have, are you aware of any instances here in the six counties or in the, across the north? You know, what sort of level of abuse is there out there? Do you have a handle on that at this point? Um, I'm going to pass over to Michael in terms of it's about the prevalence of, of the usage yep. in Northern Ireland and Michael has some lines on that. Thank you, no Michael. problem. Uh, unfortunately, Chair, there's very limited information on the usage in Northern Ireland, but we have nothing to actually suggest in any of our sort of trains that there, there is any way high usage. There's only been one uh, seizure of GHB within the last year by the PSNI, uh, and none whatsoever for GBL or 1.4 BT. Uh, in addition, in the drug deaths figures uh, over the last eight years, there's only been one instance of GHB being recorded against those drug related figures. Plus, uh, in relation to the treatment statistics and for, uh, treatment coming forward from across the HSC area, there is no real, no recording instances of people coming forward and presenting for treatment in relation to these particular drugs. So we're at the moment, we're operating on the, on the assumption that there's very low incidence within Northern Ireland and that it isn't going to have a major impact on Northern Ireland at present. Okay, thank you, Michael. And my second question before I go to members then is in relation to um, what's the situation or, or what's your understanding of the situation in the 26 counties and are there issues there? Um, how, how, how is this dealt with in, in the south? Or do you know, I know I know you've stated there what has happened in England previously. Do we know what's happened or happening in the South in relation to the uh, the, the products mentioned? Uh, not specifically, no. Uh, this information has all come from the UK basis. Uh, that has never been recorded. We have regular meetings with our colleagues down South uh, through uh, British Irish Council and uh, informally uh, between the Department of Health and the Department of Health down south. And it's never been raised as a particular drug of concern at any of those meetings uh, recently, but I'm happy to go and discuss and bring back further information in relation to how it's handled in the house if, uh, down south, if you would prefer. Yeah, that, that would be useful. And I suppose it just would be useful, particularly, or indeed, if, if, if we're acting maybe in a way that's maybe preemptive, and that's that's very good that we are ahead of it in that sense, or that appears to be the case, then it will be useful if it's done on, a, on an all island basis, so that there's no loopholes or additional problems emerge as a result of, of, of it moving across the island. Um, okay, so that, that's useful and I appreciate that, Michael. I'm going to go to members then. So first of all, I have our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, indicating, and then I have Jerry Carroll. So we'll go back first to yourself, Pam. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair, um, and thank you very much to the panel today. I think it's a, a very good brief um, on uh, this particular subject, and uh, just to say we'd be supportive of of these amendments. It seemed very common sense and a good uh, precautionary measure, given that the prevalence does appear to be fairly low within Northern Ireland. So one question for you, and that's to ask um, uh, to what extent our licensing regime for these substances um, may be in scope of the protocol, and how would any potential for divergence on the UK-wide basis be minimised going forward? I'll take, I think I'll take that one, Isabel. Um, so <laughs> in reference to the licensing regime, these are specific chemicals. Um, there would be no impact in terms of the, the protocol on licensing or um, 
you know, uh, uh, <coughs> the issuance of a license for a company. There, there, you know, there's no, there's no interference with the protocol at all. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Pam. Jerry, Lana Ray, Luna Hall. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. A uh, bit of an elementary question, but I thought it's worth asking. I mean, obviously, Isabel, you, you referred to some sort of horrendous practice uh, in England uh, and, and possible uh, increase in that practice, which is, you know, just just uh, pretty detestable and, and, and horrible. Um, but really, what we heard was that there's no real misuse of, of these uh, um, substances as, as drugs. Um, so really what I'm trying to ascertain is, I mean, is the requirement or the proposal to make this um, regulation more about, is there evidence to say there could be an increase in use, uh, abuse, misuse uh, of this uh, drug outside a uh, industrial uh, context, or is this about uh, just harmonizing really um, from the north um, with people or with procedure? Uh, in Britain, so that's maybe a bit of a technical question, but to me, just while it's not under uh, under under playing the dangers that have existed for people in England, to me, to make a regulation that doesn't seem to be um, a requirement for it in terms of policy and uh, issues raised, it just uh, raises certainly questions uh, from my perspective. Thanks. Okay, I'm happy to take that, Isabel, if you want, or to do it on my. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to make the point about the report from the ACMD making the point that there's an absence of data on prevalence and harms from GHBRs and uh, they're not routinely appearing in surveys, seizures, uh, treatments or other data sets. And, you know, there is this question around, is there something about how we're recording data? And there are several recommendations within the ACMD report relating to you know, reporting, data collection, toxicology, testing, you know, things like that, which, you know, I'm sure Michael is as well aware of as well. So I would say to you, um, Jerry, that it's it's possible that the prevalence is not showing because, and, and that's what we need to find out. So there are recommendations about improving how data is collected. And perhaps that is something, you know, in, in a couple of years time that we might find that there is more prevalence than we actually know about. Um, uh, there is something as well about parity with um, our Home Office um, colleagues. Um, there's always a danger, I suppose, that um, if we don't control these uh, drugs under our schedules and if you don't need a license for them in Northern Ireland, um, if you were found in possession of them, in, um, if someone in, in um, GB wants to come to Northern Ireland, there is that potential for you know, being able to access them and not have the same penalties against you because um, you, you're, you're here in Northern Ireland. So there is something about aligning, aligning um, the controls within both uh, jurisdictions. Sorry, Candice, I don't know if you want to be uh, I think I was more or less going to echo that, Isabel, that, you know, at the minute, the prevalence and the, and the rate of testing might... Uh, you know, it's probably quite limited, Jerry, and there, there are a number of recommendations from the ACMD that Isabel has alluded to, um, to, you know, to specifically test for GHB and, and the analogues mentioned. Um, let's hope that we don't find those, but at least if we're testing for them, that, you know, um, we might. But I suppose these, these specific chemicals and drugs are quite difficult to test for because of a, a short half-life in the body. It's, they're eliminated from the body quite rapidly. Um, uh, uh, so we don't know because we don't know the extent of the problem, but there are recommendations to take that forward and try and ascertain that. But hopefully this you know this is somewhat preemptive and stops it becoming a problem in the in the first place. Um, the second sort of maybe more technically question is the, the misuse of drugs act is reserved. So it will apply regardless of what um, the amendments to the act will apply regardless of uh, regardless of this regulation. The, across the UK. Um, so this regulation sort of normalizes or allows legitimate use um, in uh, NI. Should it be should it be required or should there be a company that wants to use these compounds uh, for a legitimate purpose? Otherwise they wouldn't be able to. Thanks. And just one quick follow-up is 
like Isabel, you said there, there's an increase or there's an introduction of a of a fine for people who are uh, caught with these um, substances for not for non-industrial purposes. Um, is it is it a new fine or is it an increased fine? And do you have the figures there that would be well, useful? Thanks. Just to clarify, you know, if, if it's the classification that Canis referred to uh, in the Act, which is UK wide. So it's the classification that is moving from um, class, all of the, the three compounds from class C to class B. So the class C maximum penalty is up to two years in prison, an unlimited fine or, or both for possession. And in relation to class B, the maximum penalty is up to five years in prison, an unlimited fine or both for provision, sorry, for possession. So they will apply, as, as Kana said, because they are um, UK wide. Um, in terms of the schedules, Canis, I don't know if you would like to come in here, but you know, Schedule One um, drugs, which is where we are placing these into Schedule One, the the substances have no therapeutic use. Uh, possession is only allowed, for example, for research, um, but you need a controlled drug license if you want to use these drugs in Schedule One. So that's really where we're tightening up those controls, so that. Um, uh, it's a, it is a deterrent. I think that's the point that Canis was making too. It acts as a deterrent to stop the problem increasing uh, if it's not here already. Thank you. Okay, Jerry, you're content yet? Okay. Okay, um, so we will move on to consider the, the rule further. So I can uh, thank the panel for attending. I know, Isabel, that you're coming back immediately on to the next panel as well. So we'll see you on the other side of that. But I just want to thank the panel members for attending, providing your evidence and taking questions from the committee. And to wish you all well and, and keep safe in the time ahead. Gormi Agat, and we'll move on to our formal consideration. Thank okay. you. Chair, sorry, Chair, can I just say that um, my name was forwarded in error. It's my colleague, Karen Simpson, is going to oh. be dealing with the next uh, from our policy area. Okay. Yeah, fine, Isabel. So thank you then and, and good luck to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Sure. Okay, um, so members, we will now cons formally consider the SR. I can advise members that this SR is subject to the negative resolution procedure and that the examiner of statutory rules has no issues to raise. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? Nope. So therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 342, um, the, S, the, the Misuse of Drugs Amendment number 2 regulations, NA202, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yep, members are agreed. Thank you. So moving on, members, then to item 10, which is SL and SL1. This is an SL coming towards the committee now, and it's in relation to the Human Medicines Coronavirus and Influenza Amendment Regulations 2022. I refer members to the Minister's Letter at tab 10 of the pack. Members, this statutory instrument will amend the Human Medicines Regulation 2012, which govern the arrangements for the licensing, manufacture, wholesale dealing and sale or supply of human medicines for human use. Departmental officials are here to brief the committee on the provisions of the regulations. So I would now like to welcome Miss Karen Simpson from the Department of Health. And Karen, if you'd like to give us your title there, please, and we can check your audio. Sorry, Chair, we're not hearing Karen at the minute or seeing Karen. Yeah. Okay, so I will move on to the second person. So, sorry, Karen, sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair, can you hear me now? Yes, here and I can see here and see you there. Hi, Karen. What's your yeah. job title, please? I am acting head of medicines legislation branch. Thank you, Karen. Um, Mr. Chris Garland from the department. Chris, uh, could you check audio? Can you hear me okay? And could you confirm your job title, please? Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. And I'm senior principal pharmaceutical officer in medicines policy branch. Okay, thank you, Chris. And we are hearing and seeing you okay as well. Uh, Martin Coleman from the Department of Health. Martin, can you hear us and can you confirm your job title, please? I, I, can, I can indeed, Chair. I, I'm uh, the head of the, the COVID vaccination program policy branch. 
Okay, thank you. And Alistair McGains. And Alistair, uh, can you confirm that you can hear me and your job title, please? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you, Chair. And I, now I've got my microphone working as well. Um, I'm head of the health protection branch, uh, and for this purpose today, I'm, I'm head of the flu vaccine program. Okay, thank you. So I will, uh, I will then go back. Uh, I welcome you all, firstly, this afternoon to the committee, and thank you for attending. And I'll go back to yourself, Karen. Is it you that's doing the opening remarks? And if so, yes. go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to brief the Health Committee today on the proposed statutory instrument relating to the continued support of the UK COVID-19 and flu vaccination programme. The UK Human Medicines Regulations 2012, or HMRs, govern the arrangements for the licensing, manufacture, wholesale dealing and sale or supply of human medicines for human use. The committee is aware the HMRs were amended in late 2020 to add flexibility to some of the normal rules that would ordinarily govern vaccine supply to patients as part of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The changes were to facilitate the mass vaccination campaigns that have been taking place against both seasonal flu and COVID-19 once vaccines became available. The amendments which had the effect of increasing the vaccinator workforce were applied to the flu vaccine as well. The overarching policy objective being to facilitate the deployment of safe and effective COVID-19 and flu vaccines in order to protect public health. When the HMRs were amended in 2020, some of the changes were giving lapsing dates of the 1st of April 2022. These provisions were initially introduced temporarily as they were either considered exceptions to business as usual or delivered new ways of working, which we wanted to review after implementation. At the time the temporary regulations were made, there was lots of uncertainty, uncertainty around the vaccines. But now we know that the vaccines and indeed the mass vaccination programmes have more than proved their worth and we need to retain flexibility to deal with unknowns. Therefore, following review, stakeholder engagement and a public consultation, it is proposed to make three of the temporary provisions permanent and extend two others for a further limited time period in order to continue to support the effective rollout of COVID-19 and flu vaccination programmes. I will begin with the three provisions that are to be made permanent. The first deals with increasing the vaccinator workforce and occupational health for NHS bodies and seeks to make permanent the changes previously introduced to the range of registered healthcare professionals who can administer flu and COVID vaccines as part of the occupational health schemes of local authorities and specified NHS bodies. Flu and COVID-19 vaccinations for health and care workers are often administered through occupational health schemes. And prior to the 2020 temporary changes, the only people authorised to administer injectable prescription only medicines as part of an occupational health scheme were doctors and nurses acting under written instructions of a doctor. Making this change permanent will help to ensure that we have the workforce needed to continue to deliver a mass COVID-19 vaccination program, as well as an enhanced flu vaccination program to HSC staff. If these provisions lapse, we will return to the position where only doctors and nurses operating under written instruction of a doctor are authorised to administer injectable prescription only medicines and occupational health schemes. This would cause delays in vaccinating health and social care workers. The second provision to make permanent deals with increasing the provision for parenteral, which means given by injection or infusion, administration of prescription only medicines, including vaccines under a patient group direction by national health service bodies or local authorities. This provision permits parenteral administration by a health and care professional who is classed as an appropriate practitioner. Without this provision, there would have been significantly fewer, fewer professionals able to administer vaccines, leading to vaccine wastage, slower pace of administration of vaccines and potentially greater pressure on a smaller pool of staff. We are not aware of any safety concerns arising from a year of operation of these provisions. Thirdly, to make permanent the delivery by community pharmacists of flu and vac COVID vaccination services under a patient group direction outside their normal registered premises. This provision has facilitated new deployment models by community pharmacy providers outside their registered premises, such as the delivery of flu vaccinations to care home staff at the care home site or the delivery of COVID-19 vaccines at pop-up clinics. Community pharmacies across Northern Ireland play an important role in offering both the annual winter flu vaccination service and the COVID-19 vaccination services. 
Currently, 280 community pharmacies in Northern Ireland are participating in the COVID-19 vaccination service using the Moderna vaccine, while 74 are still providing AstraZeneca. Engagement with stakeholders has been very positive about retaining the ability to deliver vaccination services from different premises on a permanent basis. It remains the case that this is an enabling provision only and community pharmacists are not required to provide services in this way. I will now move on to the remaining two temporary provisions that were due to lapse on the 1st of April 2022 as it is proposed to, as it is proposed to extend these to the 31st of March 2024. The first to extend to the 31st of March 2024 is the ability for flu and COVID vaccine stocks to be shared between locations without the need for a wholesaler dealer license to be in place by extending provisions set out in Regulation 19, Section 4A of the HMRs. Licensing and marketing authorizations are important parts of the medicines regulation regime. Situations can, can however arise during mass vaccination programs where there are more vaccines that are needed in one healthcare organization and too few in another separate healthcare organization. The supply from one to the other would be classed as a wholesale distribution supply and therefore normally subject to having a wholesaler dealer license under regulation 18 of the HMRs. If such a license is not held by the organization because it is not required for normal business, this can lead to problems and delays with moving the vaccines between such service providers and runs the risk that patients cannot access the vaccine that is necessary for public health protection and vaccines are wasted. Throughout the COVID-19 vaccination campaign, on many occasions, mutual aid has been used to rebalance the system between vaccine providers and to redistribute vaccines to the places where they could be used best or had the greatest need. The programme would have struggled without this flexibility. Under normal circumstances, the requirement for wholesaler dealer licences is an important safeguard, but in providing this flexibility, an important mitigation against any risk has been the provision of guidance to providers around maintaining safety and product integrity throughout the COVID and flu vaccination programmes. Continued flexibility for a further period would be of benefit to public health, and we therefore propose to retain these provisions until the 1st of April 2024. And secondly, to extend to 31st of March 2024, provisions which relax some of the governance rules on the assembly, preparation and labelling of medicinal products and the need for manufacturers, licences and marketing authorisations to enable the necessary actions taken by pharmaceutical companies and healthcare professionals to specifically prepare COVID-19 vaccines for administration to the public. These relaxations were under the proviso, proviso that the actions were done under the health service arrangements. This has meant HSC teams have been able to use the skills, their skills and expertise of their staff in appropriate areas much more effectively and for various professions to focus on their areas of speciality, enabling safer systems of working, particularly at larger sites. Continuing this flexibility for a further period would be of benefit to public health and we therefore propose to retain these provisions until the 1st of April 2024. For the two provisions being extended until 31st of March 2024, a review will be carried out prior to this end date to decide whether it will be made permanent, whether another temporary extension will be sought or whether these flexibilities will lapse at this stage. I will now give some details on the UK-wide public consultation that took place um, from the 8th to the 29th of December 2021. The Department of Health ensured the consultation was circulated as widely as possible in Northern Ireland using the Department's public consultation list and placing the consultation on the Department's website. 125 consultation responses in total were received, nine of which were from individuals based in Northern Ireland and two from organisations, Pharmacy Forum NI and Community Pharmacy NI. The consultation analysis found that respondents who stated that they were, that they were NHS health service delivery or social care professionals were broadly supportive of the proposals. Individuals who didn't identify as health service delivery or social care professionals overwhelmingly disagreed with the majority of proposals, but provided very little evidence relating to the specific consultation questions. Their comments were generally about their views on the COVID-19 pandemic itself. Where there wasn't support for the proposals, the most common alternative was respondents wish to see was to allow the provisions in question to lapse. 
The consultation did not cover who would or who would not be vaccinated as part of the COVID-19 or flu vaccination programme or how the health service in each UK nation would commission or run it. The HMRs give each nation the option of doing so within a clear and supportive framework governing medicines, should they continue to use them. To a great extent, these proposals are enabling, essentially supporting a range of options that the health service in each UK nation will have available to them. I will now move on finally to the, the statutory instrument. The SI will apply on a UK-wide basis and the regulations will be subject to the draft affirmative procedure and section 476C of the Medicines and Medical Devices Act 2021 stipulates that when regulations are made jointly, they must be laid before and approved by a resolution of each House of Parliament and the Northern Ireland Assembly. In terms of next steps, DHSC colleagues plan to lay regulations in draft form in both Houses of Parliament on the 7th of February 2022, and we plan to lay them in the Assembly on the same date. An Assembly debate on the regulations is required as part of the process, and we're hoping to have this debate week commencing the 7th of March 2022. We are in regular close contact with DHSC colleagues and have made them aware that in order to secure a joint signature within the current mandate, these regulations need to be led in draft, debated in the Assembly and, if agreed, made prior to the commencement of the pre-election period. Chris and I are here and happy to answer any questions members might have on the proposals and my policy colleagues, Martin and Alistair, are also in attendance to address questions that members might wish to ask on the COVID and flu vaccination programmes. Um, thank you for this opportunity to brief you. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, so um, I suppose in, in, in general, you know, these are these are ones that I do recall very well when these were first brought in and debated at length, and I think have played an important role in relation to the pandemic response and our ability to address the, the conditions there. In fact, I suppose my question arises really around the fact that given we had this in place and, and we're now looking at extending it, I wonder, in a sense, was it used enough? And my, my reason for that question is we're aware that the GPs over the past period of time have had to administer an additional 500,000 vaccines in terms of the booster and third vaccines at a time when they're under huge pressure to also deliver appointments to, to patients. So given that we have approved additional people who could do this service and we took in applications, and, and I'm aware that there were over... Uh, 25,000 applications still on the department's desk around the workforce appeal. Why weren't we more successful in removing more of the pressure from the GPs as a result of, of this being in place? Uh, will I take that one, Charlie? Yes, could you take that one, Marty? Yep. No, no uh, you're right, Chair. There was quite a good response in terms of volunteers for, for the programme. And I think the PHA did do a lot of work with them in order to, to process the application forms and get them placed in appropriate locations. Now, in terms of the actual booster programme, initially it was going to be a, a much more of a, a steady pace rollout. Uh, uh, GPs, uh, we had consulted with the GPC for Northern Ireland and the, and the Royal College, and they were very much in favour of being involved in, in the programme for the steady rollout of the booster programme. Initially, it was the groups one to nine, which would have been to everybody aged 50 and over, as well as those considered in a clinical risk group under 50. Now, obviously, that changed dramatically with the arrival of the Omicron variant, and that did, uh, you're right, uh, cause a, a bit of an issue in terms of just speeding up the programme. But by that point, um, it wasn't really feasible to try to direct people elsewhere. And I think GPs proved themselves to be extremely successful in that they did do the, the heavy lifting with the booster element of the programme. Overall, the trusts have delivered well over 1.7 million doses of the COVID vaccination programme. Uh, and GPs, it, it, was, it was around sort of 800,000. But with the additional 500,000 on top of that, that's taken them up now to, to almost 1.3 million doses given, given as part of the, the vaccination programme. The, the, the majority of those obviously being the booster. So I think I think our plan was right at that stage in terms of it was meant to be, the booster was meant to be a steady rollout. It was just we, we didn't expect the Omicron variant arriving when it did and, and obviously leading to JCVI's advice to expand it rapidly to, to everybody uh, 16 and over, as well as sort of some of the, the, the younger age co cohort being included now in the booster, uh, and also for it to be done in such a short period of time. It was really, uh, it, was, it was a massive push to get it done uh, in the run up to Christmas and early into the new year. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And actually, actually, I think that's a really interesting point, Martin, around, you know, that nobody knew Omicron was going to emerge. We're still in that situation where that those unknowns are out there. And as such, I think it's very prudent that we would retain the flexibility that are inherent within some of these measures and indeed the underpinning legislation, which we had mentioned earlier, and we are writing to the department around our concern on that similarly. And I think given the grounds for extending these, it speaks to the need for having the underpinning legislation also in place. The other thing I want to say, and it's not really a question, I think it's probably more of something that I would like you to take back because I am and was aware of very many people, some of them really, really well qualified, retired professionals in some instances, or people who are not working for other reasons, who tried to come into the vaccine support program and didn't get responses from the department or couldn't make their way onto the list. And I'm, I'm talking about, in one instance, just to, just, to, just to flag up the quality of the, the applicant. He had been a nurse his entire life, had retired as having been for 10 years a lecturer in Queen's University of Nursing, and he wasn't able to navigate the system to come back in to fulfil the role that we're we are allowing for here. So I think that needs to be considered very carefully because there's no point in passing regulations if the system is not in place to implement them. And I think that's that's an important an important one to bring back. The other thing I want to say, and it's just a comment, and it's, it's more of a political comment, it's not overly relevant as such, but just to say that when you're talking there about uh, easing the issue of providing from one supplier to another, it reminded me of the whole issue around equity in vaccines globally, and this is a global pandemic. And I think the issue of, of the fact that none of us are safe, that everyone is safe just in general terms in vaccines, uh, speaks to the need to for the world to continue to act flexibly and together in this response in a similar way to, to the, the regs that we're looking at here in front of us at the minute. So um, I certainly would, would be supportive, I have to say, in relation to the prudent, uh, the prudent extension of uh, measures that allow us to react quickly to what are potentially ongoing significant uh, developments in relation to COVID-19 and indeed the other pressures around flu and GP and all of health and social care generally. And I also very much do want to welcome, I think, the, the, the element of extending the ability for community pharmacy to continue to play the wider and very positive role they have played is welcome as well. And I think is also a model for the future at how we can look at expanding the ability of, of elements of our health service to provide support to communities uh, in, in ways. So I think that's welcome as well. So thank you for that. Um, I'll go then to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, and then I have Deborah, and I'll keep an eye out for any other indications from members. So Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Karen, and the rest of the panel for your attendance at committee today. Um, um, I do want to concur with those comments that the Chair made, especially around community pharmacy. I think very welcome and actually um, speaks to, you know, wider transformation and, and, and what could be done and done differently and in different um, areas using the expertise that is out there. Um, I wanted to ask you around, um, that given that 98% of the Northern Ireland medicines come from GB and we rely on access um, to national distribution networks to ensure su supply is replenished, we, that we are generally supportive of these um, joint steps to, to ensure that flexibility to move stock between locations is, is retained. Um, it would be helpful to know to what extent these elements of the human medicines regulations would become null and void should the protocol take full force in our statute book. So, um, I mean, you did talk about um, where this is with the rest of the UK, but if you would just clarify to what extent um, um, these flexibilities are replicated in other jurisdictions, including uh, the EU. And then I wanted to ask whether um, if the, if Northern Ireland was to feel the full force of the Irish Sea border arrangements for medicines, would we be able to benefit from the provisions of this rule? Chris, do you want to come in on any of that? Um Thanks, um, Karen. Yes, um, so I suppose, the, as, as Karen has outlined, the human medicines regulations are a, a UK-wide framework for the, um, the provision of, of medicinal products in, in, in all elements. Um, it, it, the human medicines regulations were, were by and large, um, based on EU codes at the time when the um, 
UK was was a, a member of the European Union. Um, in, in terms of these these amendments, um, they, they, these are are being made on on, on a UK wide uh, basis. Um, they they um, are, are not impacted by um, the protocol um, based on our, our assessment um, and, and not impacted by, by any uh, changes uh, in terms of, of European uh, medicines law. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And we have Deborah there. Go ahead, Deborah. And then I'm going to Carol and then Paula. So, Deborah, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. And I'm sorry if this was covered in the briefing, um, but I had a wee bit of issue with some of the sound there um, with with my, my laptop. Um, in terms, this might seem like a simple question, but why are the flu vaccines covered by the emergency legislation given they are, you know, very well established? Well, for, for us, this is about the workforce, because during the COVID um, pandemic or d d during this period, we needed to have that expansion of workforce to for we had an expanded flu, flu programme as well um, in order to, you know, to protect people against flu and COVID. So that's why the expansion of the it was really an expansion of the workforce um, that we sort of seen that would support the flu vaccination programme. OK, thank you. Okay, that's you, Deborah, is it? Yeah. Moving on then to Carol Nicholson, Carol Lanaray, Liddell. Thank you, panel. Um, I suppose, Karen, it's just following on from your point about the workforce. So this is to ensure that both um, any other vaccinations as well as the flu vaccinations are able to be given outside of what's normally there at the minute and. Would it also be anything to do with the fact that you know, GPs are really busy um, and it includes for other health and social care professionals to be involved in vaccination? I'm just seeking clarification. Sorry, could you run, could you run that one past me again? I'm not really sure if I, I kind of... So, so your, your point to Deborah was it's to allow for workforce you yes, know, we're expanding. Practice. Yes, yeah, we are. Yes. That, that the, the provisions are to expand to allow more people, registered health professionals, to you know give to give vaccines, and then that supports the vaccine program in itself. You know, because if you didn't have that that workforce enabled to do that, well, then you'd have a very small pool of people able to administer vaccines. Okay, so Karen, my next question is really, you know, in terms of workforce planning and the point that Colin raised, we've heard this issue about retired or former health and social care staff um, putting themselves forward to become vaccinators and the whole process is so cumbersome and we've also heard that uh, there's still a lot of difficulty with people getting access to their GPs yet GPs are one of the cohorts who've been vaccinating so what additional work is the department doing to ensure that people who apply to be vaccinators are put through the process in a timely fashion and if they're not successful, what feedback are they getting and what form is that feedback in? Yeah, I think that's the one we, we need to try and take back to the department. Um, because I haven't I wouldn't be involved in that on that side of things. Um, but I, I take your point, yes, we're putting these regulations in place, but then what is the process? You know, we're putting the regulations in place, but what is the process behind behind it and are we able to avail fully? off the regulations and I think that's that's the point Colin was making as well. And Karen, sorry, when you're seeking the information from a department, could we also as a committee get the list of professions that could be drafted or used, brought in to be vaccinators? That would be really important because I remember speaking to some dentists who have, you know, administered anesthesia and have said that they too would be interested in helping with vaccination. So could we just get that list for the committee, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a good suggestion, Carol, as well, in light of the fact of hopefully we then can cross-check and cross-reference the 25,000 applications versus the people who are allowed, and we can use that to draw people forward. Um, Paula? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for this update this morning. Very interesting, I suppose. Carol covered part of um, what I was going to ask there, but it, it, 
In the paper, it talks about make permanent changes to the range of registered healthcare professionals who can administer the, the vaccines. And I'm just wondering, you know, how frequently that is actually going to be reviewed. Obviously, the word permanent jumped out at me a little bit there. And, and the second part of it is, um, you know, what role will, will, is there currently or could be for the likes of community pharmacy technicians or, or you know, those people who are maybe not the highest level within that profession, for example, or I'm talking about like even dental um, nurse um, support staff, and also then the role for those people who are, for example, in their final year of medicine who, you know, who, are, who are, have already got significant work experience, you know, is there any role for them even under a supervised capacity? I just, I'm just very conscious as others are that, you know, GPs and, and other people who are in the front line are so stretched that there's probably people there who could perform this task um, and take that pressure off them. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, do you want to come in on any, on any of this? Uh, yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, so uh, I suppose in relation to the point around uh, non-registered healthcare professionals, so thinking you know, like some pharmacy technicians, um, et cetera, um, there have been provisions um, in the 2020 amendments for non-registered staff members to support the vaccination protocol that has mainly been through the use of, of uh, vaccination protocols, which have been a new legal mechanism that was introduced to support um, the, the, the uh, or provide a basis for these groups to administer vaccines. Previously, we would have relied quite heavily on patient group directions, uh, which are set out in the human medicines regulations. However, their use is restricted to uh, a defined list of healthcare professionals. So the, the use of pandemic vaccination protocols has provided a mechanism for those groups who aren't uh, able to vaccinate under a PGD to, uh, to to participate and support the vaccination process. So that has absolutely, um, uh, you, you know, helped to, to utilise a, a broader skill mix within, certainly within community pharmacy as well, and use of pharmacy technicians and support staff as well. Medical students absolutely have played a really, really big role uh, within the, uh, the, the, the particularly the, the the large mass vaccination centre at the SSE arena as well. Um, so so we we absolutely have um, made you know use of all elements of the the, the twenty twenty amendments as, as well. Um, your your point around uh, the, the the permanent amendments, uh, Paula, I suppose it, it relates uh, specifically to the the proposal here to make permanent uh, the. the expanded list of healthcare professionals that can uh, vaccinate under occupational health schemes. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as Karen's outlined previously, um, only doctors or nurses acting under the direction of a doctor could actually administer uh, vaccines under occupational health schemes. And I think really um, it, it doesn't recognize, you know, those previous provisions didn't recognize the advances in, you know, in, in, in recent decades where, you know, we have greater use of, of um, you know, other healthcare professionals and making broader use of their their range of skills. So, um, yeah, Chris, Chris, yeah, I appreciate that. No, I, I think thank you for that. But I, I think it was more around you know how frequently this list is going to be reviewed. For example, to you know take in account um, other or other emerging roles or you know positions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly. Um, I mean, the 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 the, um, the provisions that we that have, we have outlined um, that that are being extended. There is a commitment there. Um, so I think we we can certainly um, take that back in terms of a, a review date for the, the more permanent provisions and, and come back to the committee on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Paula. Okay. So. Um, Listen, thank you. I think we can move on to our formal consideration, um, including, including that, that point that Paula has raised there. Um, I want to thank you, Karen, and, and your team there for the briefing. I have to say both of the last two briefings have been very, very good in terms of the information and the clarity provided around it, and I just do want to acknowledge that. Um, and also, you know, people there to answer a range of questions that, I just, I just think they've been, they've been very good um, in terms of making it clear, and, and the committee, I think, do appreciate that. So thank you for that. We will go ahead with our former consideration of the rule, and thank you for acknowledging and, and taking some of those issues back for consideration, and hopefully those will be uh, worked into the, the SR when that eventually comes back to committee. Thank you, and good luck to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, Thank you for that. So before I go to to official uh, to to uh, formal, I'll, I'll take views from members. 
One of the things I maybe just would like to ask in relation to, we have previously asked the Minister and he has agreed to provide us more information on the, the, the outstanding applications that they have. I think it would be useful if we could get a breakdown from that, and maybe it's already included, Clerk, in the letter that's gone out. But if we could get a breakdown of the background or profession of the peoples of the people who have applied to assist, then we could use it to cross check, you know, their relevance. So can I ask you, Clerk, just to check if that's not included specifically, could we add that to our request to the department in terms of clarification on the outstanding list? And 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 hopefully that will also include those who have dropped off or not suitable. But I guess there's there's bound to be quite a few people who are still there. So if members are content with that, I'll ask the clerk to do that. Um, Paul, are you also there? We're indicating that 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 we would like to see. I think what what you're saying was I'll bring you in, Paula. But uh, were you saying essentially you'd like to see maybe a review built into the permanent elements so that there is a chance to see how that's progressing? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so members otherwise content or any other comments to make? No, thank you. Clark, are you content with clarity on those issues? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, then, members, moving on to our formal consideration then. Well, actually, this is an SL1, so it's just simply a matter of asking, are members content with the proposed statutory instrument? Yeah, mm -hmm. members are content. Thank you. Okay, members, moving on then to our final session on the on the SRs and LCMs. This one is an LCM, a Legislative Consent Memorandum, and this is in relation to virginity testing and hymenoplasty. The Minister has advised that he intends to lay a Legislative Consent Memorandum in relation to both virginity testing and hymenoplasty. I refer members to the Minister's letter at tab 11 of the pack. Departmental officials are available to brief the committee on the provisions of the proposed LCM. So I'd now like to welcome, first of all, Mark McGookian, or Mark McGookian, who's Director of Disability and Older People. Can you hear us okay, Mark? I can, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kerry Loveland Morrison, who's Head of Adult Safeguarding Unit. Can you hear us okay, Kerry? Kerry, can you, Are you able to hear me here? Yeah, we're hearing you there. Yeah, we're hearing you there, Kerry. Thank you. Laura Smith from the Adult Safeguarding Unit. Um, Laura, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thanks. And Philip Totten from the Adult Safeguarding Unit. Philip, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much for attending committee this afternoon and uh, I'll go back just to yourself, Mark, just for advice. Is it yourself making the opening remarks or, or some of the rest of your team? I will make some very brief opening remarks, Chair, sure, if that's okay, and then hand over to Kerry. Yeah, so, Chair, Ch sure, again, thank you for taking the time to see us this afternoon and I appreciate the committee's had a very long morning, so we keep our opening comments brief and then we'll take questions if that's acceptable. Um, as you've already said, we're here to discuss a legislative consent memorandum, um, which is on the health and social care bill, which has been laid in the assembly. I understand the committee has already um, considered a number of LCMs on this bill. Um, and we are here, as you said, to, to speak on one in relation to amendments to the bill, which seek to criminalize virginity testing and hymenoplasty. Um, Chair, I'm, I'm gonna hand over to Kerry and she's gonna take you through the detail of this. And then i say after that, we'll be more than willing to take questions from members. Thank you, Mark, and uh, go ahead, Kerry, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chair. Um, the Health and Care Bill seeks to reform the delivery of health services across the water, and the practice of virginity testing and hymenoplasty are health and social care issues. Health is a matter which has been transferred and which the Assembly has full legislative powers over, and so the other devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales are also bringing forward legislative consent motions on these issues. Um, part five of the bill seeks to ban the practice and process of virginity testing, which is the gynecological examination of female genitalia with or without consent for the purpose of determining whether a woman or girl has had vaginal intercourse. The bill is also seeking to ban hymenoplasty procedures, the practice and process of hymen reconstruction undertaken on a woman or girl for the purpose of creating the impression that she has not had vaginal intercourse. Virginity testing and hymenoplasty are ha harmful and intrusive practices which are widely regarded as forms of violence and abuse against women and girls. They are categorised as honour-based abuse 
as women and girls are often coerced or pressured into the procedures to protect or defend the honour of their family and or their community. A woman or girl who fails a virginity test is likely to be forced into undergoing a hymenoplasty procedure to create the impression that she has not had vaginal intercourse prior to her wedding night. Virginity testing is not recognised as a medical procedure, nor does it carry any scientific or clinical merit. The procedures are not offered in healthcare facilities here, in either trust or, or private facilities regulated by the RQIA. The Health and Care Bill, as I'm sure you'll know, has already been introduced in Parliament, and it is anticipated that it will receive royal assent in or around April or early May. We have consulted with colleagues in the Department of Justice who have advised that there's likely to be no impact on the justice system here for the criminalisation of these two procedures. We've also consulted with colleagues in the Executive Office who have confirmed that they have no issues with the criminalisation of virginity testing or hymenoplasty procedures. They are continuing to work with officials in all departments and with stakeholders to bring forward the wider violence against women and girls strategy. The Department of Health and Social Care in England has concluded that the practices of virginity testing and hymenoplasty amount to a violation of a girl or woman's human rights. We agree with their assessment and recommend for the committee's consideration the legislative consent memorandum to criminalise these procedures here. So thank you again, Chair, for the opportunity to come and talk to the committee today. And as Mark said, we're happy to take any questions that members may have. Okay, thank you, Kerry and Mark. Um, I have to say, I find the uh, the 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 outline of of the procedures just simply abhorrent. I have to say, and and fully support that that measures would be taken to ensure that uh, such uh, abuse would not be inflicted on girls, young girls, or women, or anyone. Um, and I think it's it's absolutely. Um, Disgraceful in that sense. So you have touched upon the fact that these are being these are being taken in a similar fashion across Scotland, England, and Wales in relation to the twenty six counties. Are you aware of what the situation is there, uh, and is there a way to uh, is there a way to communicate that 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 the department here are taking forward this LCM and to advise the, the twenty six counties so that we don't create any potential for any uh, any uh, loopholes or any anything like that. So have you been? Sure, well, we haven't sure. been in touch with. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I'm, I'm not sure that we have we have checked the position in in the Republic of Ireland, Chair, but we will take that forward, and certainly we'll take on board the comments about being able to advise them that we're we're taking forward legislation to criminalise the offences within Northern Ireland, and 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 make sure that they are advised of that. Apologies, Chair. Um, it's something which we haven't looked at, but I, I did ask the team, given your comments on the previous two two pre presentations, to check that out. So we, we will take that position forward for you. We're happy okay. to come back to the committee on that, uh, if that will be helpful. Yeah, I pre appreciate that. I appreciate that, Mark. Um, I think it's essential that we cover all, all the bases in that respect. So thank you. Paula, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for this really important LCM. I'm delighted to see it. I, I suppose my first question was, you know, how prevalent would it be in Northern Ireland? Um, and also, what will how will this be monitored? You know, what's the role, for example, of GMC in terms of this or, or reporting mechanisms if, if a colleague suspects another colleague is, you know, what, how, do, how will this work in operation effectively? Thank you. Kerry, do you want to take that one? Mark, do you want me Please. to take that one? Yeah. Um, so we have confirmed that um, these procedures are not happening here in um, any facilities managed by the trust or regulated by the RQIA. Um, however, the World Health Organization did identify Northern Ireland as one of the places in which um, virginity testing has taken place. Um, so it is not happening officially. Um, but it is possible that it could be happening privately. Um, and that's why we think it's important to introduce the criminalization of these procedures here. Um, so, yes, th that's the position in terms of um, happening in practice. I suppose the, the, the second part of my question was in relation to, you know, how, how would it be reported, you know, whether it's the, the 
the girl or a friend of the girl or a woman, sorry, or whether it's a, a colleague or, you know, how, how, do, how do people bring forward concerns or actual information um, around this taking place? I suppose once it has been criminalised, then it would be a matter for police to take forward um, once it was reported. So the purpose of doing this is to make it something that can be reported and investigated rather than something that isn't covered by legislation as is the current position. Okay, well, sorry to labour this, um, Chair, but I suppose, is there not a role then for GMC or some other regulator around um, you know, professional conduct in, in relation to, to, to the performance of this? Well, there will be guidance developed um, as this work continues. So um, there, there, there is still work to be done on um, how it will all be put into practice. Okay, thank you. And I suppose the communication with the Royal College of GPs, etc., will be very important. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. Um, Pam? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, um, for your attendance on this really important subject. It's, um, I'm pretty appalled, too, that we even have to um, take a briefing on this type of issue, and I, I think it is very concerned to hear that that there's some kind of evidence that this is, um, has been happening in, in Northern Ireland. But um, I wanted to ask just really one question, and that was in relation to whether um, this legislation would have any impact on um, health professionals or police investigations, say, um, in progressing allegations of um, sexual assault, um, particularly in relation to uh, medical reports etc um so we have consulted with doj colleagues on this matter um the dhsc had provided some information about uh, statistics um from across the water and we do anticipate that um the impact on the justice system here would be minimal um it's anticipated to be very, very low in england and therefore would be even lower here um, however, we do still think it's important to criminalise these procedures um, to try and give that protection to women and girls. OK, so just for clarity, then, um, it would have an impact, even though it, it's minimal. Um, but it could have an impact. So in turn, it could have an impact on, I suppose, um, collecting evidence of serious sexual assault. I, su I suppose, uh, Deputy Chair, it, it, it could impact on, as you say, the, 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 the information gathering for other offences. And I think by criminalising this, this would allow police to investigate that more fully to see if this practice had been part of, of that assault or that assault on a woman or a girl. So I think as a package of measures, this would strengthen the process of investigating crimes, sexual assault or, or sexual crime. So I think as part of that wider package, Deputy Chair, it would be a very important step forward. OK, thank you for that, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Pam. And going in, finally, I think, to Carol. I don't see any other indications. Go ahead, Carol, at home. Uh, we're not good, Carly. Um, Carrie, I just wanted to try and get some clarification. So this is going to make it illegal for just across the board, but you did mention in some of your remarks that it's currently not happening in any public or private hospitals that are overseen by the RQIA. What other circumstances would a practice like this happen, please? Well, it's possible that it could be happening in private or family settings rather than in um, an official facility that has doctors and so forth. Um, so I suppose that's the situation that we're mainly envisaging here. And uh, so I suppose this would be, you know, this procedure, and I agree with the chair, it's abhorrent, but this um, practice would then still have to be conducted by a health and social care professional. Um, I think in the case of hymenoplasty, you're talking about um, a medical procedure there. However, virginity testing is not a medical procedure. Um, so 
theoretically you wouldn't have to be a doctor in order to do that okay so then it's really just to make it sure the people are aware that it's illegal and certainly yeah. that it's sexual assault and, okay. and i think yes, carl, carol to, to, to follow up on that as well i think this could be potentially happening in some faith-based settings so it wouldn't necessarily be a clinician or a medical practitioner under, undertaking those procedures or if it was happening within families it wouldn't be a medical practitioner potentially undertaking those procedures so it wouldn't just be criminalizing um, medical practitioners to do it would be criminalizing the offense so i think it, it does strengthen that where it is happening outside those organizations which are, are registered or are overseen by rqia uh, at the minute it's not an offence at all. So to, to criminalise it, it it does ensure that that whole umbrella, whether it's faith based or community or within families, that it is it is criminalised across the board. I'm just reluctant to ask, but I really have to. I mean, what do you like? What faith based sentence would be? I, I I think it's it's just within certain communities. This would be seen as as more prevalent, uh, certainly across in, in, in GB. So it's just to make sure that, that all those settings could be seen uh, uh, be criminalised across the board, Carl. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, and thank you to the panel. Um, so I want to I want to just uh, as I said previously just to just to thank each of the uh, the departmental panels that we've had there today it has provided very clear information around the the issues under consideration and a range of people to answer a range of questions and that's that's really welcome I have to say and I want to acknowledge that um, I think it's just appalling and it actually it actually chills me to think that people would consider in any way that 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 would be acceptable and I I am I am. Glad to be able to be part of ensuring that this is very clearly made a criminal offence, and there are no black and whites around this. This is criminal behaviour, and and I think it's important that it's brought forward, regardless of how, uh, how, how even one incident of this anywhere on these islands would be absolutely disgraceful. And I think it's therefore important that across the islands we move to uh, remove any doubt about the acceptability of these practices so thank you mark and thank you to to carry and thank you to your team there for for briefing the committee and for taking it and we can go ahead and move on to our consideration formally but we can we can allow you to uh, to go ahead thank you all take thank care and thank you thank you so members um thank you for that um so members, that, 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 that then concludes our um, meeting. I'll just check with Clerk that you don't need anything further in relation to the LCM. We have debated and discussed and raised some issues there. Is there anything further needed by way of clarity from the committee? Chair, just to say that um, once the LCM is laid, we'll have um, sort of 10 days to write a report. So what we'll do is a couple of items that they said to follow up with, we, we'll try and get a response. And then that means we include that in the committee's report as well. Um, but I'll get confirmation of when the, the motion's being laid and then um, I'll, I'll draft up a report based on um, today's discussion and some of the issues that were raised um, just for committee approval before it goes into the assembly. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. So, thank you, members. So that 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 that's fine. Thank you for that. So, members, moving on then to item twenty, the last remaining item. Any other business? Do members have any other business today? No. Um, thank you, members. Then I move just to the final item, which is date, time, and place of our next meeting. Um, our next meeting will be on Thursday, third of February, twenty twenty two, at nine thirty a.m. by Starleaf. And I just want to acknowledge on that note the intense amount of work that members have put in to uh, the committee over the past number of weeks before Christmas and after Christmas and, and during Christmas recess even in order to move all that all that business forward and uh, I just want to acknowledge all of your work and to thank you for how you all addressed and come at all of all of what have been very difficult and complex issues so thank you for that and I uh, want to wish you all the best between now and next week's meeting and I'll see you all again soon thank you